And so um, Inga Brower is our first speaker, and she's going to be giving us some background on the state of nutrition and food systems today. Go ahead, Inga. Thank you, Amy, for giving the opportunity to say a few words on malnutrition and the role of healthy diets and especially of underutilized foods from forestries and agroforestry. Um, the recently launched uh, Global Nutrition Report um, shows us already uh, that uh, before COVID-19 came to our world, uh, the levels of malnutrition persist at already unacceptably um, high levels. And as we know, malnutrition comprises undernutrition, micronutrient deficiencies and overnutrition, uh, like overweight and obesity. Uh, this report shows that one out of nine uh, people in the world suffer from undernutrition. And that also one out of three uh, suffer from overweight and, and obesity. And although there are large disparities in malnutrition between countries and also within countries, uh, and whether you are from a rural or an urban area, uh, whether you're a boy or a girl, whether you had education or not, uh, whether you're rich or pure, uh, poor, uh, the report also shows that over 80% of the countries suffer from at least two forms um, of malnutrition, and it also shows that... I'm sorry uh, to interrupt you, Inga, but we don't see your yeah. slide. We, your oh, slide sorry. hasn't moved from the, the first one. Yes. Yeah, great. Sorry. Um, so this slide is showing that over 80% of the countries do suffer more than two forms of uh, malnutrition. And it also shows that overweight is not only a problem of high income countries um, and not only a problem of uh, urban areas, but it's rising a lot in low and middle income countries and rural areas. So we know that poor diets are actually one of the major causes of uh, any form um, of malnutrition. And we also know that these diets are arriving at us through our food system. And these food systems are changing uh, very quickly uh, from uh, more traditional uh, food systems to uh, modern food systems and consumers starting to demand more diversity, uh, convenience and safety in their diets. And diets are transitioning towards consuming more animal fats, sugars, and highly processed uh, foods. Um, and as highlighted in many international reports, um, the urgency to transform food systems to deliver nutritious foods for all uh, within planetary boundaries um, is high. So in our program, we actually have two starting points. Um, one is um, that we think that starting from diets will help to identify entry points to transform food systems. So instead of having a production oriented uh, approach. And secondly, um, the context in which these food systems have to transform to healthy diets are very important. And it seems most sensible to start uh, this transformations towards healthy diets um, at a country level. So the first questions we often get is what is actually a healthy diet um, in our context? And uh, we know from uh, WHO and from the Global Burden of Disease uh, Group uh, what a healthy diet should entail. So sufficient fruits, vegetable, nuts, seeds, legumes, whole grains and animal sourced foods. Uh, but also moderate or no consumption um, of red meat, highly processed meat, sugar, sugar, sweetened beverages, salt, um, and alcohol. And these are general guidelines um, um, that are globally applicable, but need to be translated to the local context to understand what a healthy diet actually is, uh, based uh, not only on evidence we have on the association between food and health outcomes, but also on the availability of food, uh, preferences of consumers, uh, cost of foods, um, etc. So actually it's the food-based dietary guidelines who will give us a good insight in what a healthy diet is in the context um, of a country. But um, there are not a lot of countries who do have this food-based dietary guidelines. And if they have, um, some of them are rather vague and um, they do not include, uh, for example, amounts. And what is especially missing is the role of underutilized or orphan foods in this food-based dietary guidelines or in healthy diets. Uh, because there's a lot of missing knowledge, uh, not only uh, about their nutrient quality, but also about their availability, um, et cetera. And I would like to plead in this short um, intervention uh, that when thinking about healthy diets, um, especially in a local context, there's urgent needs 
to incorporate foods um, uh, that are underutilized or coming from uh, forest and trees and agroforestry, and not only because of their superior nutrient quality, uh, but also because they can fill uh, seasonal gaps and they can contribute to the resilience of food systems to crises like COVID-19. Uh, thanks a lot, Amy. Okay, thanks so much, Inga. Um, now we're gonna hear from Stefan McMullen on the use of food trees on farms. Sorry about that, yes. No, it's, uh, it's working, yeah. Okay, I'm Stefa, yes, with um, World Agroforestry Bay based at our headquarters in Nairobi, Kenya. And today I'm gonna to be talking about trees on farms and promoting diversity for nutrition. So agroforestry is the integration of a diversity of cultivated and managed trees into farming landscapes for greater productivity and resilience. And so given the multiple benefits of having trees on farms, we at World Agroforestry have developed an approach known as the portfolios for making site-specific recommendations for increasing on-farm tree diversity to target food security and nutrition. So these portfolios are combinations of indigenous and exotic food tree and crop species that could provide for year-round harvest and also address gaps, micronutrient gaps in local food systems. To develop these site-specific portfolios, we need to understand more about the local food production and consumption systems. And so in our projects, we characterize the farming landscapes to understand food tree diversity, crop diversity, and also food security. We also engaged the communities we were working on with to develop food harvest calendars to understand seasonality and also to allow these communities to prioritize species for food and nutrition, but also for income generation. We also needed to understand more about the local diets to see what was lacking and we focused on women and children who are often the most nutritionally vulnerable. We collected data on key indicators such as dietary diversity, which shows diet quality. And we also captured um, quantified food consumption to understand what people were eating and also to identify micronutrient gaps in local food systems. And so taking this type of data and the local context into consideration, we're able to devise and customize these uh, site-specific recommendations. So this is an example of a portfolio developed for Katui West in Kenya. We first of all identified a diversity of food trees that have been prioritized with the communities. We then further added vegetables, staples, and also pulse crops. And we indicated their months of availability, including during months of food insecurity. We further then matched these foods with nutrient content information. To develop the portfolios, we needed to understand the local food production and consumption system. In our projects, we first characterized farming landscapes, including food tree species diversity, crop diversity, and food security. We engage the communities to develop food harvest calendars to capture seasonality and also to prioritize species for food and for income. We also needed to understand local diets to identify what was lacking. We focused on women and children who were often the most nutritionally vulnerable. We used several indicators including dietary diversity, which shows diet quality, and we also captured quantified food consumption to better understand what people were eating and for identifying micronutrient gaps in local diets. And so based on this data and taking local context into consideration, we use the portfolio approach for, re for recommending increased species diversity on farms. This is an example of a portfolio developed for a site in Kutui County, Kenya. We first identified a diversity of food trees that have been prioritized with communities. We then further included vegetable staple and pulse crops. For each of the species, the months of availability are indicated, including during months of food insecurity. The foods were then matched with nutrient content data for key micronutrients, vitamins A and C, iron and folate. We also developed a scoring system to simplify this information. However, for some species, nutrient content data is missing. The gray shading indicates where data is not available. And you can see the difference here between data availability for other crops as compared to that of the prioritized food tree species, mostly indigenous ones. Indigenous species are very important in local food systems because they are often more adapted to landscapes and therefore resilient to variable environmental conditions. Nutrient content data is not only important to this approach, but this data plays a key role in linking agriculture to nutrition. 
To address data gaps and to highlight where data is missing, we have compiled, standardized, and aggregated nutrient content data for over 90 food tree and crop species, now available in an open access database. Indigenous species are not only more adapted to their landscapes, but are nutritious, with African species marula and baobab having between three and five times the amount of vitamin C than orange. Without adequate data, particularly for these indigenous and underutilized species, this could mean that certain crops rich in micronutrients are overlooked in food systems. Portfolios as location-specific recommendations must also be made available to the communities and partners we work with. And we do this through multiple entry points, including schools, establishing agroforestry hubs, and community seed and seedling nurseries. One of the biggest challenges to planting and growing a diversity of food tree species is the availability and access to quality planting material. The portfolios are a recommendation for promoting greater diversity of food tree species and crops on smallholder farms. This approach and the database can support decision making for integrating diverse and nutritious species to target food security, nutrition and income. And of course, the importance of indigenous species for their nutritional value and also their resilience in current and future food systems should be prioritized as we harness the value of trees for food and nutrition security. Great, thanks so much. Um, since we had some technical difficulties in the beginning, I would just like to ask the audience, um, could you put up the Slido slide, please? Monica or, or Fabio. Um, so we, if you could all, um, if you could all please go to slido.com and sign in using the code GLF bond 2020. This should be in the Whova chat and choose FTA. And please answer the, our first polling question. So it seems like a bunch of people were able to do that already. And so we see some of the answers coming in. So we'll come back to this after we hear from Prasad Hendry, who's gonna be talking to us about the African, or African Orphan Crop Consortium. So Prasad, go ahead, please, and share screen, thanks. Hello, all. I'm Prasad Hendry. I'm working as genomic scientist with uh, C4E Graph, and I'm also genomics lab manager for African Orphan Crops Consortium. Um, so African Orphan Crops Consortium is our vehicle to address the nutrition issues in Africa. Africa is one of the major affected continent by malnutrition and hidden hunger. So the conceptualization of African Orphan Crops Consortium was uh, happened in, in the year 2011 with stakeholder consultations, mainly the African Union and, and the African government. Uh, the formerly genomics lab of AOCC was opened at c 4 Craft Nairobi in December 2014. So what are the neglected or often crops? Uh, we are defining these crops in the context of Africa. So they're African often crops, uh, which are under-researched, under-invested by the donors, underrepresented uh, in the scientific community, in the donor community, and often neglected by the policy makers. But that doesn't mean that they're neglected by the local community. They're equally important uh, at the local and regional level. They are adapted, they're resilient, but they're not the top usual eight to 10 suspects, the maize, weed, barley, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the vision of AOCC is to provide the localized solution. Here we are emphasizing a lot on localized solution because they are the best option based solutions to address stunting hidden hunger. And we are doing it by generating uh, genomics resources for 101 African orphan crops and training 150 African plant breeders to use these genomic tools for genomics driven breeding programs. Uh, the, the, the founding, uh, the major uh, backbone of AOCC is a strong public private partnership. Uh, it's, uh, we all agree that it's impossible for any organization to develop all the skill sets and capacities at a single location. What we have done is we have taken the best, uh, the specialists on board uh, in a decentralized approach, a lot of private, public concerns, research institute, universities, uh, companies, industries, they're all on, on, on board and they have brought substantial investments to in the AOCC. Uh, so in the beginning, we had five founding pa partners, members, uh, the NEPAD, which is now AUDA, the African Union's Development Agency. Uh, then we also have WWF, UC Davis, uh, MAS, and ICRAF as five founding members. And now the partnership has increased to 28. Uh, the partnership is uh, in the five major aspects, major areas, science and knowledge. Second is analytics, computation, 
instrumentation and reagent support, advocacy, policy, fundraising, and the industrial, uh, um, industrial partners. Um, we have 101 crops, which are mandated by the African Union. The day they are distributed, around half of them are woody trees. The remaining are annuals, some are tubers, rhizomes, non-woody fruits, palms, climbers, vegetables. So it, it spans a lot of uh, diverse dietary uh, um, uh, components. All the orphan crops are inherent nutrient rich, but they are low yielding because nobody has invested in them. And they have the capacity to go for dietary diversification, healthy diets, human health, to develop resilient and sustainable farming systems, climate change mitigation, and planetary health as well. So this table provides a few examples of uh, around uh, 15 uh, orphan crops that we have uh, worked a little bit on them. Uh, the next we are, I'm showing just example of five AOCC trees and uh, you can see that diverse, they have diverse usage, they have diverse, uh, the, the, the location, they are distributed in various parts of Africa. For example, Ellen Blackia, Baobab and Shea, uh, they have some of the Baobab is, is all over Africa, whereas Ellen Blackia is very specific to humid tropics. Shea is again sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, they form, they are forming various different components of the food diet, food systems. Some of them are export oriented commodities. Some of them are consumed at local level. Uh, Moringa, we know it's very important for, uh, for nutrition uh, because of uh, it's, it's, uh, it's high, high nutrient content. Uh, Marula is another tree which has got industrial value. So it, it spans all sort of uh, trees, um, all sort of market values and, and uh, market chains. Um, because AOCC also deals with annual crops, I'm showing here a few of the annual crops along with the tree crops and how they're important uh, due to their nutrient contains. Uh, but this is all about the nutrition, but how, what, what genomics is doing for that. So genomics is all about to understand the genetic basis of these nutrient types or trait, uh, trait uh, or the phenotypic traits and improve them using breeding. So in short, what we are doing is what we call them as uh, genomics assisted breeding, where uh, we look at the traits using genomic landmarks as indirect tools of selection. And this selection leads to development of new varieties and uh, new clones. Uh, when we look at nutrients at streets, uh, we, we, the, the people, the farmers are being selecting uh, nutrients at streets by looking at indirect uh, indicators like skin color, pulp color, test, texture. And traditionally, they are being assayed using biochemical assays. But by genomics, we have now ways to look at the genes and pathways which are important for bringing out those uh, nutrient contains in the foods. So with the, with the genomics, we have been able to dissect some of the components of yields, like there are genes which are known, which are already known for uh, what are the for, for for high yielding and biomass. There are genes which are responsible for shelf life, and in the same way, there are genes which are known to be playing role in nutrient storage, nutrient transportation, and translocation. So these are the uh, so the various uh, branches of biology, like systems biology and genomics, are helping us to improve the tree, the yield and nutrients together using these tools which are genomic based. Uh, if you want to know more about us, you can visit our website that is africanoffencrops.org and it, it gives complete detailed information about our, our work, what we have done. Thanks, Great. I thank Thanks so organizers. Much. Thank you. Thank you, Prasad. Um, can we see the result of the Slido to see where everybody's coming from? See where our audience is? Monica, can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, great. So it looks like we have strong representation from Germany, UK, Italy, lots of people tuning in from Indonesia, from Kenya, sustainable livelihood. That's interesting. <laughs> um, so it looks like we're mostly have people from Europe and Asia, then a little bit from Africa. We have some people from Ethiopia and Ghana with us. So it looks like we have a pretty diverse audience. So that's great. Um, so now I'm gonna ask the, the second Slido question. Remember I said they were gonna get progressively more difficult. So the next question on Slido, if you could go back to slido.com and answer the next question, which is what was the last tree food that you ate? And while you guys are doing that, we are going to load um, our next presentation 
Um, our, our next presenter couldn't join us today. It's Daniel Ofori, who's the director of the Forestry Research Institute of Ghana. And so he sent us a pre-recorded uh, presentation in which he talks about how the process um, that Prasad was explaining and how part of that process, he's gonna walk us through that for one uh, underutilized crop. So let's see what Daniel Ofori has to say. Today, we're going to talk about Tetrapura Tetraptera for health, food, and nutrition. This tree, as you find here, is a typical tree in an agroforestry setting. The fruits are used as food supplements. They are also used in the African traditional medicine for control of lots of diseases, particularly hypertension, diabetes, arthritis, and so on and so on. To make it easily available for consumption, Forestry Research Institute of Ghana has set up a plant to extract syrup from the fruit so that it can always be available on the table for consumption. Looking at the potential of this species, Forestry Research Institute of Ghana has also come up with a domestication program where it is raising seedlings for planting in agroforestry setup and also encouraging farmers to grow the seedlings in their farm landscape. This species has multipurpose functions. One, planting in agroforestry system for diversification. Two, use as nutritional supplement. Three, in the play has a role in the traditional medicine. Four, has a role in livelihood improvement because a bag of the fruits which weighs about 25 kilograms, is sold for $10. And the institute alone buys over $6,000 of fruit for the extraction of the syrup. Sometimes you buy more about 10,000, sometimes um, it comes down. So looking at the nature of this, that is why Forestry Research Institute of Ghana is promoting the domestication of Tetrapura tetraptera for inclusion in agroforestry system. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, uh, Daniel, even though you can't hear me right now. Um, can we see the results of the Slido? Let's see what was the last tree food that most people have eaten. <laughs> So I guess some of that I would have predicted. So we see lots of apples, um, some avocados, some cherries, mangoes, general nuts, almonds, some guava, some interesting type of berry variety, uh, custard apple, honey, okay. Um, baobab, moringa. The Philippines? <laughs> I guess that was the response to maybe the previous question. Um, lychee. Um, so it's it's interesting um, variety of different foods. Um, um, I know who put olive oil because we talked about that before because I think that's something that people don't often think about that olives come from trees. So hopefully this is getting starting to get you thinking about about the the diverse diversity of foods that we get from trees and the roles that they play in our lives. Um, <clears throat> there's a, uh, another question, the next question on Slido that you can go to um, and answer at your leisure. So over the next, we're not gonna be getting to those results for a while. And now I would like Celine Termote um, to share her screen and to present on some of the work that she and her team are doing on work with uh, communities in increasing diversity of diets. 
Um, good afternoon. I am Céline Zermote, and I would like to present you the integrated community-based approach for farm market and diet diversity. In this presentation, a little bit focused on traditional leafy vegetables, but definitely an approach that can be used with trees, depending on community's interests as well. So I'm taking you to Vihiga County in Western Kenya, where we first developed the approach. We started with a diagnostic survey on agrobiodiversity, diet quality and nutrition. And this was followed by a series of workshops through which we developed community action plans. After that, a baseline survey was carried out. We implemented the action plans for about one year and then we organized an endline survey. The results from the diagnostic survey learned us that Vihiga County is rich in local food biodiversity with 67 cultivated plant species and 38 wild edible plant species. However, only 45% of women and 75% of children consume the diverse diet and stunting affected 28% of the children in Vihiga County. This slide shows some pictures from the community members actively drawing their own community action plans. The workshop started with some restitution of the results from the diagnostic survey. Then we explained what a healthy balanced diet should look like. And we also discussed the gaps in their current diets, after which people were given pen and paper to draft their own community plans. Now at this point, they were a little bit surprised and they were looking at us asking, are you not going to tell us what we need to do to improve our diets? And our answer was, not really. We are giving you a chance to draft your own plans and make sure they are realistic and feasible within the timeframes and so on, because you will be the ones, after all, implementing your own plans. This made a little shift in mindset happening. And after that, the community members even came together in between the workshops to refine their plans, to draft budgets, to draft timelines and so on. Once the plans were ready, a local NGO guided them to set up their kitchen gardens. The Ministry of Health Extension Workers, the Ministry of Agriculture Extension Workers guided them to set up food units. And the county nutritionists and community health volunteers organized cooking demonstrations and door-to-door -door nutrition counseling. And that everything according to the community action plans. So after one year of implementation, we organized an endline survey whereby we randomly sampled households with uh, women and small children from the whole sublocation, from the whole intervention sublocation, not only the ones that were members of the implementing groups, because we were interested in seeing the effect for the whole community and also to see some spillover, what, what with the spillover effects. So we saw that the mean dietary diversity score for children and women significantly increased in the intervention sublocations compared to the control sublocations. And we also found that the percentage of children reaching minimum dietary diversity significantly increased in the intervention sublocations. Um, these results were also published in maternal and child nutrition journal. So meanwhile, uh, our original sublocation groups evolved into farmer resource centers. We've set up additional groups um, in Vihiga County and reached similar positive results. We are also pilot testing the approach in Turkana County and in Tigray in Ethiopia, adding a component of wild foods in the portfolio. And our community seed bank in Vihiga County is almost up and running. This will help to improve access to the quality seeds of the traditional leafy vegetables, that being one of the major bottlenecks. The seed bank will also serve as a central resource center for information exchange and learning. And they will also create a platform for engagement with private and public sector actors so that they can discuss business plans, market strategies, and attract funding. From next year on, we will also be integrating fruit trees in our portfolio. And we are actively engaging with Vihiga County stakeholders developing a roadmap towards the sustainable food system based on agroecological principles. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks so much, Celine. Okay, can, can we pull up the next Slido question, please? No, the next one, the next question. 
Thanks. We'll come back to the answer to the previous one a bit later. No, the one before that you have? Yeah. Okay, so this is a question um, for all of you. This, is the, this one gets a little bit more difficult. Do you think that wider use of underutilized crops can really address problems of nutrition or is it just a niche thing? So you can answer yes, assuming that there are the proper investments. You can answer no, which you don't really think that they would really make a big difference. Or you can have another answer that you can type on your own. So um, we'll take, can you take the slide off for a minute, please? So every, you guys can go to slido.com and, and give your answers and then we can, we can look at them a bit later. Um, and so now is the time to ask questions of the panel from the first block of presentations. So um, I want to ask uh, Inga Brower to, to answer the first question, but she could answer more than give us a little bit more information than yes or no, if she doesn't mind. So Inga, would you, would you mind giving us your perspective on that question? Um, well, um, I would say maybe, <laughs> which is not <laughs> one of the options. Um, I think they can make um, um, a difference, but maybe not at scale. And maybe that's not a scale we would like to look at, uh, because a lot of these foods are uh, context specific, but in the context they are needed. And um, also we don't know whether they can make a difference at scale because there has been no investment as said by um, an earlier presenter already. So we, we cannot, I mean, we cannot answer that question. Um, on the other side, um, we call them forgotten or underutilized species and there has been reasons for that. So we also have to look into those reasons and maybe they form bottlenecks uh, for them to make a difference um, at scale. But definitely we need more research and more knowledge about them and see whether they can solve problems locally to improve uh, resilience. Um, like we have now uh, with the COVID-19, if there would be more food available in the direct um, uh, environment of people, it would really help. Great, thanks so much for that answer. Um, now we're gonna take a question from the audience. Um, this is the question I think that had the most votes so far. Um, so the question is, can agroforestry meet the nutritional demands of people, especially when land holdings of farmers are very small? Um, so I guess I will ask uh, Stefa McMullen. Um, Stefa, are you connected now? Yes, I am, sorry if I can earlier on that was really bad luck <laughs> but lucky we had the backup presentations um yes i mean i do believe that agroforestry has a role to play um in the local food systems for people particularly those who are primary food producers and consumers and um, of course their plots of land are quite small so they must make decisions about what's the best um food species and to incorporate into their agroforestry systems um, but I would like to think that the example that I had shown about the portfolios, that it's not like saying you have to incorporate all of these diverse species, but at least diversifying away from one or two species is really critical um, to target those um, food harvest gaps, particularly for tree foods, but also the micronutrient gaps in diets. And just to touch on the, the, the other question and what you asked Inga and how she responded, is that we do need more research then on those species because they do have the potential to fill these um, nutrition gaps in diets, but we just don't fully understand the nutrition potential and, and the future for mainstreaming and, and scaling them. Um, so I would respond. Thanks so much. No, that was a great response. Um, can, we, can we go see the responses from the audience to the poll question now? Um, Monica, can you share the responses to the question about the underutilized crops to see what the audience had to say? Okay, great. Um, so um, a lot of people seem to have just said yes. Um, and then there are some qualifiers. Yes, but with sustainable investments and marketing. Yes, it needs investment in research and development. Probably, maybe, depends. Um, those all sounded a bit like what Inga had to say. <laughs> uh, yes, with appropriate investments. 
Uh, yes, diversity is good for nutrition plus cultural aspects. And to some extent, yes, there is potential with proper investment. So it, it seems like the majority of people agree that yes, it has the potential, but that it needs it needs more of a push. And I think that that seems to be the majority of the opinion, both of the audience and of the panelists that we've heard from. So um, we're, since we, apologies that we had a few glitches along the way, um, but we've run out of time for the first block of, uh, of the session. So we're gonna move on now to the second block, which is on uh, forests and wild foods. Our first speaker is Terry Sunderland, who's gonna talk to us about ecosystem services of forests for food production. And um, while Terry's setting up his share, which he did very quickly, um, I think everybody should appreciate that he woke up at 4 a.m. to join us. So thanks a lot, Terry. Uh, you can go ahead and start. Oh, thank you. Uh, actually, I was up at 3.15, and the sun is just rising here in Vancouver. It's a beautiful morning. Um, so anyway, thank you very much for um, uh, allowing me to speak here. Uh, my slides seem to be moving um, independently, so I'm not quite sure what's happening here. Um, we've uh, had a lot of interest in ecosystem services, but one of the major gaps we've had is, is how ecosystem services relate to agricultural production. And a few years ago, we undertook uh, a significant systematic review on looking at ecosystem services and the links between forest trees and agroforestry. What kind of ecosystem services we're talking about are pollination services, pest control, water regulation, etc. But also looking at how landscape configuration uh, also relinks to the interaction between agriculture, forestry, uh, and agroforestry. So um, in terms of the, the general findings of the, the systematic review, we found that there's potential to maintain, in some cases, and enhance agricultural yields. So very general findings uh, in terms of understanding the, these potential linkages. Um, and we found very positive um, uh, impacts related to nutrient cycling, pollination services, climate regulation, et cetera. And one of the most pervasive uh, uh, sort of messages that came out of the systematic review is that forest trees and agriculture equals much more resilient agricultural production systems. So more specifically, um, studies that have been coming out of Ethiopia and elsewhere. Um, we had a fantastic study that was published in, in 2018, looking at the availability of nitrogen, soil, and water use, um, and the climate regulation function of forest trees in wheat fields in Ethiopia, which actually led to increased yields and also uh, nutrient value of the crop itself. And another study also in Ethiopia uh, found that micronutrients in the soil associated with forests and tree patches and fragments had higher levels of zinc, iron, manganese and other minerals actually in the wheat itself, also accompanied with uh, increased yields. So a nice little graphic that shows that wheat grown near farms and for, sorry, forests have uh, more pr proteins, greater nutrient content, uh, content and higher yields. Um, than wheat grown on farms away from the forest. That's a pretty powerful message if we're talking about systems approaches. And a lot of this work was undertaken in collaboration with C4 and CIMIT, which shows a very nice uh, synergy between the agriculture and natural resource centers within the CGIR. Um, similar study uh, looking at livestock productivity and nutrient balances. Um, these improve with increasing proximity to forest. Um, and basically another nice graphic which shows uh, why farms have better um, uh, soils near the forest um, and it's down to basically the availability of, of fuel wood, uh, burning less dung, uh, more dung is used on, on agricultural production farms um, and also again reiterates the issue of high mineral contents related to forests and tree patches. Shade um, trees decrease the abundance of pests, this is a really nice study um, on brassica crops in Kenya um, showing a very uh, significant impact on the infestations of aphids and caterpillars and another shade study from the Western Ghats in India looking at um, enhanced coffee production crop quality in agroforestry systems, particularly forest systems dominated by uh, Gravillia robusta, um, a nitrogen fixing tree in, used in the Western Ghats. So basically this all comes down to what we think of as uh, evergreen agriculture and those uh, working for aircraft will be familiar with Dennis Garrity and colleagues paper that was published in Food Security in 2010, describing evergreen agriculture and the importance of maintaining tree and, and uh, ground cover crops uh, all year round. So key messages in terms of um, tree-based production systems, 
better than model cropping systems because of adaptability and resilience. Ecosystem services provided by forests and trees that support food production are incredibly important. And we're talking about basically managing landscapes on a multifunctional basis. We've been banging on about this for, for quite some years, but we're showing with evidence that this is actually a, a route forward in terms of understanding more complex food systems. But obviously the caveat is that forests and trees alone will not achieve global food security um, uh, objectives and aims, but can play a major role. And of course, in the recent years, obviously indicated by this particular seminar and others related to it, the discourse has started to change in adopting um, forests and trees and agriculture as a more a systems and integrated approach. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Terry. That was fabulous. Now we're going to have Leandro Costello uh, talk to us about one of these ecosystem services of forests and the relationship between forests and fish in the Amazon. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Leandro Costello. I'm from Virginia Tech. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, so I'll be talking about the importance of floodplain forests for fish catch. And this is based on my research in the Amazon. So um, if you haven't been to the Amazon, here you have it. What you see on the screen is the main Amazon river. And the vegetation that you see on the sides of the river is are the floodplains, and specifically the floodplain forests. The Amazon, like most other tropical rivers in the world, has a strong seasonality in rainfall. And so when it is uh, the dry season, which is the time when this picture here was taken, um, all the fish populations are found and they inhabit the main river channels and the uh, floodplain lakes that you can see there on the top of the screen. However, when it is the rainy season that causes the water level of the rivers to rise by sometimes up to 10 meters, all of the river and obviously the adjacent floodplain forests, they become flooded. The fish, they migrate out of the rivers and the, the floodplain lakes and they go into the flooded forests. And they do that because in this environment, they find an abundance of food items. They find uh, detritus in abundance. They find the fruits that fall from the trees, insects, leaves, and a whole broad range of food items. And they spend about almost six months of the year living in this environment and feeding uh, very, very actively. After six months or so, the biomass, the total amount of fish population in the system increases by, by quite a lot. And that, say, added um, amount of fish population in the system is utilized by riverine peoples. In the Amazon, Amazonians, a lot of them, uh, basically they have entire livelihoods dependent on fishing from a cultural, economic, and livelihood perspectives. Amazonians eat uh, fish, uh, fish uh, sustaining per capita fish consumption rates that are six times the global average. And that includes riverine populations as well as urban populations. A lot has been said um, you know, in the literature and in the news about the effects of deforestation of tropical forests. But until very recently, pretty much almost nothing had been said in terms of what are the effects of deforestation for fish production and food security. So this is an area of my research. And a few years ago, we undertook the say challenge of assessing the effects of deforestation on fisheries. So for one of the areas of the Amazon basin that had suffered a fair amount of deforestation, the lower Amazon region, we put together a data set, including um, basically for a series of floodplain lakes, we put together fish catch data for 12 year period and we measured the amount of forest surrounding those floodplain lakes. So overall, we had a data set comparing uh, how much fish was caught in the lakes and how much forest those lakes had around them. The result was a, basically a simple uh, positive correlation between uh, the amount of forest here on the y-axis and catch per unit of effort, CPUE, which is basically just a standardized measure of fish catch. What these results show is that lakes with greater amounts of forest around them provided fishers with greater fish catches. So um, in line with a lot of the other presentations here in this session, what these results show is that um, 
Conservation of tropical forests is important to sustain fish populations, which are important for food security. Having said that, I want to thank you for your attention. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Leandro. So that's one of the connections that a lot of people don't normally think about when they think about the relationships between forest and food. So that was, that was great. Could we see the results from the Slido on wild foods now? Okay, huh. Okay, so a lot of people had blueberries and elderflower, um, nettles, durian, wild garlic. Never heard of that, awesome. Papaya, wild strawberries, uh, nopal, don't know what that is. Wild berries, figs, salmon, uh, wild strawberries, but in June, 2019. <laughs> okay, so compared to the, Compared to the Slido on tree foods, there seems to be less variety of responses here. It could be, okay, so some people are, are adding some more now, that's great. Um, this could also be kind of reflective of where our audience is, but there are some, as you can see, some of the foods are from um, probably North America or Northern Europe, some of the berries, um, uh, probably the, the possibly the nettle mushrooms are in all over the world. So this is great for giving us a taste. <laughs> Get it? Um, for some of the wild food use, um, uh, some of the wild foods eaten all over the world. So now we're going to go to a, a short clip, a short film clip from Zambia, that looks at um, forest food consumption in a community in Zambia. So I think Deki, you're going to load the video. Is somebody loading the video? Okay, great. Ifo fili fia kulia, ifo tuidi mina fuwe ne, ifo tulia, ne fia kulia, ifo tu amukseenda mumpanga, ifo tulia na ava na nuru polongse panganda. Ifo tu seenda mumpanga fia kulia, tu amukseenda ifungo, ama fruitsi, ama suku, impundu. Elo muna ni tulamukusenda pupwe amena kuchuru mumpanga. Uboa, umena mumpanga. Uboa mataipsi ya lafula. Kuri ubusefwe, chitondo, sanfwe, pampa, tente, kavansa, ifikoloa. Tuwaisa senda mwomule mbwe pimpa. Mumbali yelu nguko. Uichichi muticha musukuichi. Eku efishimu. If you tweet a much even bachelor swat in Ivana Musuku. Will you muto boy you? Kula and Pambata. Much even bachelor su, tweet Okutila, Nim Pambata. If she mufiadi quata a massacre. Munsta idea, dear Kadi, if you to add and deco, if you could have a shan, fiale, full of Kuliba Yabakari. No more putting an anger in Nosta to Fikirepo. Babantuna of Fudisha. And if you are a little bit of 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 a Ukuwe kata na nguvala nsha nyana baka na vee sabadi hawa liteka ichalu. Pakuwe wati, nabadi hawa nabambi obo tulefi hawa bashira kula kuisa sangu kudifiri hafi ya kudia. Pakuti nabee nabake sesa nguwa kwa mwashala kufetu nono atiba nabandi oko tuwafu mine kwa hafi nefi. Great, so now we got to see what it looks like, what wild food look like in Luingu, Zambia. Now, uh, next we're gonna have a pre-recorded presentation by Caleb Yango. So Caleb is with us, but we were worried about his connection. So he sent us a pre-recorded presentation, but he'll join us for the panel if anybody has questions for him um, after this. Morning. Greetings, everyone. My name is Caleb Tata from Cameroon, and I'm going to be talking about the importance of wild food use in Cameroon. They do form a major part of our diets here in Cameroon. And 
it's exciting to talk about it. This slide shows us a number of wild foods that are consumed in Cameroon. And um, SNED, back in 2013, did a study uh, in several major cities in Cameroon, including Yaoundé, Boya, Limbe, uh, to find out what wild foods existed in Cameroon and also find out how much they costed, the prices. And so I was involved in this study and these are some of the wild foods that were picked up as mostly consumed all across the country. Uh, we have the bush mango, which is a seed mostly used in making soap as uh, soups. Uh, the picture to my top left going through to right. And then we have the safu, the African plum. And then with the fern, then we have the jangsa, uh, which is also used in making soups. And to the bottom left, we have the bush onions, which is a spice, uh, the termites, uh, very rich in protein, the pebe, which is also a spice used in cooking soups. Um, then the ogbono, which, um, sorry, the okongobong, which is uh, the green leafy vegetable. And then the alakata pepe. And at the center right there, we have the bushmeat, uh, various wild animals. And then the eru, which is the dark green leafy vegetables uh, that grows in the forest. And uh, I will talk a little bit about the eru later. And uh, also in 2016, we did a survey of 247 women uh, in the southwest region of Cameroon in an area called the Takamanda. And here we were trying to find out the contribution of forest to the diets of women and children. And actually we surveyed um, eight villages, four of which were forest-based villages and four of which were non-forest villages and in general we found out that the uh, forest foods were really used in these communities and so they depended a lot on uh, forest and so this next slide shows us this bar chart uh, of the percentage of women who consumed these wild foods in the previous 24 hours so each time we went to survey we would ask the women to tell us the foods they ate the previous day and so we recorded it and it showed that most of the women consumed uh, Ogbono, which is the picture to my top left, the seed, which is used in making soups. And also a number of them, majority of them consumed Eru, the dark green leafy vegetables, which is very rich in, in, in lots of minerals. And also they consumed mushrooms and uh, bush meat and uh, jangsang, which is the picture to my top right. One of the things we were trying to understand was why women who lived near the forest had higher hemoglobin levels and lower rates of anemia than women who lived far from the forest. And so from the data, we ran several models to try to see what to explain what the difference was, why the difference existed. And so we also controlled for a number of variables, uh, including food groups, uh, demography, consumption of bushmeat, assets, uh, malaria and worm infections that were self-reported. And also we, we looked at the most commonly consumed forest foods. And we did find out that the only variable that could explain the difference was the consumption of Aero the dark leafy vegetables. And so we came to the conclusion that the consumption of air rule did account for higher levels of adjusted hemoglobin in women in this forest area. So though we understand that more research has to be done to understand how this works biochemically. And so we, we think that wild foods to make important contributions to diet quality uh, and nutrition in women, children, and also men in Cameroon. So thank you very much for your time. Great. Thanks so much, Caleb. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I do hear you well. That's great. Um, <laughs> That's great our next great. presentation was also pre recorded for the same reason. So, Bronwyn Powell is going to present on the role of wild foods in indigenous food systems and culture. And she will also be joining us live for questions. But just in case she had problems with her internet, we thought it was safer to play the recording.
Hello, my name is Bronwyn Powell, and I'm an assistant professor of geography, African studies, and anthropology at Penn State University. Today, I'm excited to talk to you about the role of wild food as cultural ecosystem services and in the cultural heritage of Indigenous food systems. Not only are wild foods important for nutrition and contributing to food security for communities all over the world, they also provide an important cultural ecosystem service to both Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities all over the world. Wild foods are often foods that people are very fond of. They're foods that people are attached to. They're foods that have a central place in traditional culinary habits. And as such, they are part of an intangible cultural heritage. What the act of collecting and harvesting wild foods help to link communities to the land. They provide an attachment to place that helps ensure motivation for protecting of those ecosystems that provide those wild foods. Indigenous scholars in North America note that Indigenous communities perceive a deep relationship with all species within their ecosystems, and that this relationship extends to a responsibility to ensure the collective continuance of all those species, and that when traditional harvesting practices are lost or damaged, not only is the continuance of that ecosystem threatened, but the continuance and well-being of those indigenous stewards for that ecosystem are also at risk. Indigenous and minority communities all over the world have traditional food systems that are uniquely adapted to their ecological context. And these food systems can be placed under pressure by policies that are not attentive to those unique social ecological adaptations. For example, the Gums in Ethiopia, unlike many of their neighbors, consume a lot of wild food. They consume a lot of bamboo shoots uh, in an area where the bamboo forests are an important source of food, and their shifting cultivation ensures the uh, productivity of a traditionally valued local uh, lab lab bean variety. However, the government is now discouraging shifting cultivation, and this may threaten the gums people's ability to continue to grow this traditional lab lab variety that is culturally important. Additionally, across Western Ethiopia, although hunting is now illegal, it remains very common, and efforts to enforce the hunting ban could have negative implications for both the cultural and nutritional well-being of these communities because these are places where livestock disease is very common, including uh, African trypanosomiasis and others, and communities have very limited access to veterinary and agricultural extension. Similarly, in Indonesia, where the majority of the population consume rice as a staple, the traditional food systems, such as those found in Papua and surrounding regions that are based on sago, are unique. However, with increasing production of oil palm in some regions of Papua, there's been a large increase in the number of non-Papuan people living in these communities. And with them, these immigrants have brought new ideas about food and uh, the increased infrastructure has brought greater access to highly processed foods such as deep fried chicken nuggets, sausage and noodles. Policymakers need to be attentive to the fact that these minority and indigenous food systems can be vulnerable to policies made to work in other contexts that are not attentive to the unique social ecological context of in indigenous and minority communities. Biodiversity conservation cannot come at the expense 
of Indigenous peoples' right to food, nor should it come at the expense of their access to traditional practices and important cultural foods. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much to both virtual and live Bronwyn. And for our, our last presentation will be uh, from Mulia Nurhassan, who's gonna to talk to us about changes in forests and changes in diets in West Papua, Indonesia. Now? Yep. Okay. Hi everyone, thank you for uh, the opportunity to share with you. Do you have my screen now? Yeah. Can you tell me if you have my screen, yes. Amy? Yes. yes. yes we thank you see. for the opportunity to share with you what we have learned and are still learning about dietary transition and food system disruption in forested areas of Indonesia. Um, Indonesia consists of more than 17,000 islands and in the past diets in one region could be very different from another but diet uh, has transitioned towards more homogeneous, more uh, processed and less uh, local food consumption. This has contributed to the increased rate of overweight, obesity and non-communicable diseases. And this dietary transition is happening all over uh, the country. It coincided with the rapid deforestation. Uh, we know forests uh, provide ecosystem services that can be used directly or indirectly for uh, uh, for food production activities. Uh, this map is showing Indonesia forest cover loss from 2008 to 2017. In one of our study, we, uh, we uh, uh, pick few uh, regencies as the most and the least uh, deforested areas in Indonesia. And we compare the dietary transition in these uh, areas. So we learned that diets uh, in both most and least deforested areas of Indonesia transition towards very similar trend. Uh, it's transition towards more uh, edible fat, sugar, caloric snack, non-alcoholic beverages, uh, which are sugar sweetened beverage. But interestingly, the diet in uh, more forested areas where the green bars, they are uh, the people who live there, they're still consuming higher amount of uh, local staple food, fresh fish, dark green leafy vegetable, and less uh, amount of uh, edible fat, sugar, and uh, non, uh, the, sorry, uh, sugar sweetened beverages. But because diet is transitioning, so it's easy to find kids drinking Coke oh, and their parents are hunting in the wild. So it's very interesting from a uh, food uh, environment perspective. So I wanna bring you to where those pictures came from. Uh, it's West Papua province uh, located in the largest tropical island in the world with 75% uh, of its forest still intact and the largest biodiversity in the whole Southeast Asia. This GIF map is showing you the three cover loss from 2000 to 2007 to, to, to 2018, sorry, 17. And it seems like it doesn't change, but it's actually changed. The province has done a remarkable job to keep their forests intact. And what's also uh, inspiring is that how the local uh, uh, government are committing themselves to conserve at least 70% of their forest cover. And they have requested C4 to work with them to harmonize the food security agenda with uh, their conservation plan. And as part of that activities, we had done several uh, focus group discussion and uh, when we were talking with the mothers as the community members, they were complaining about how their children would use pastel power to make them buy uh, ultra processed snacks every day and make them spend a lot of money on it. Uh, the uh, institutional stakeholders, they're very confident that they said we have everything, our land will grow, uh, can grow uh, the food we need. Uh, as long as our our people are willing to uh, consume local foods, and they uh, admit about the dietary transition, and they describe the the, the, the dilemma as uh, we still rely our food security to uh, the forest. We are still doing hunting and gathering, but at the same time, we're doing it less and less because it's easier to access imported food from outside Papua. 
So now what happens during pandemic, uh, I mean, uh, West Papua is uh, the province that is located in the easternmost part of Indonesia. And some of the area have very challenging road access and a high malnutrition rate. It's one of the province with, uh, that is least developed in the country. So what will happen when uh, food supply can no longer uh, reach West Papua and they are no longer uh, familiar with the local foods? So what the local government are doing now is that they increase campaign for local food production and consumption, hoping the pandemic will accelerate the process to achieve more sustainable and resilient food system. They are aware that the pandemic is a challenge because uh, of impact of food system disruption is worsened by the heavy reliance on imported foods. But they also think this could be an opportunity because local communities are eager to improve their dietary pattern to be more sustainable uh, with higher local food consumption. Now C4 is uh, working with our local partner, uh, Research and Development Agency of West Papua Province. Uh, we uh, want to try to understand uh, the, uh, how uh, online platform helps uh, local harvester to reach uh, consumers in the urban area. So these women are uh, indigenous local harvester who live in the forested areas of West Papua and they harvest their uh, fruits and vegetables and sell them to the uh, urban consumers. But uh, ever since pandemic, uh, with the help of local NGO, they have been assisted using online platform to reach their consumer. We aim to understand uh, and learn from them uh, how forests could contribute to create uh, healthier diets and more resilient food system to people in the rural and uh, urban area. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mulia, for that great presentation. Now we're going to see a short video clip about some of the processes that Mulia is talking about from another part of Indonesia. So she was talking about the East, and now we're going to move to the West and hear from people on the ground what their experiences are of some of these processes. Jackie, can you please load the film? <laughs> Nama saya Maria Ludiana, saya berasal dari Sekedau Dua. Kalau makanan dulu, ya, yang sering kita masak dulu, paling da daun, daun singkong, pakai serebung, yang di dalam hutan tuh segala daun ara. Pokoknya daun, daun yang di dalam hutan pun masih, masih mudah kita dapat untuk sayur. Tapi sekarang tuh karena sawit udah masuk, udah agak susah kita dapat sayurnya. Mudah didapat, di hutan pun mudah didapat. Segala ikan, ikan sungai, sebelum sawit masuk, kalau mancing itu mudah dapat. Kalau sekarang itu ada agak sulit. Itu adalah berupa hutan dan saat ini berubah menjadi kelapa sawit. Dan dengan adanya dinamika itu, kami juga melihat bahwasanya ada perubahan tidak hanya dari respon sosial, tapi juga berdampak pada status gizi dan juga pola makan. Dan jauh ini kami melihat bahwasanya masyarakat yang tinggal di hutan menggantungkan hidup sepenuhnya kepada alam di mana bahwasanya alam itu merupakan komoditas utama mereka untuk mendapatkan makanan dan kemudian beralih menjadi perusahaan kelapa sawit itu juga menyebabkan mereka kehilangan akses makanan untuk mendapatkan makanan liar di hutan sebagai gantinya mereka mendapatkan akses makanan yang lebih pada makanan kemasan dan akhirnya beberapa tradisi mulai sedikit ditinggalkan yang berkaitan dengan pola makan tradisional Jadi bumi ini kalau bukan kita jadi dokter merawat bumi ini hilanglah bumi. Kalau dokter ngobatnya sarikan bumi ini bisa selamat. Kalau air itu menjadi darah manusia, kalau bumi nafas manusia. Semua tanaman kalau nak ada di bumi kemana kita? Kalau nak mati. Nama saya Bani, tinggal di kampung Sungai T. Alam Sungai Makit kami, karena di situ cukup. Apa aja yang mau diambil itu di situ. Ubatan di situ, sayuran di situ. Kemarin kita sore itu itu makan malam kita dengan pakai siap mirah kan. Pagi ini udah daun singkong, siang nanti mungkin ini, begitu. Arus gini ini ini giliran, 
kalau dah nak ada di mana kita dapat giliran makanan Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Now uh, we we are finished with the presentations. Um, now I would like for you all to go back to the Slido and answer our next question. Now that everybody here is an expert. So what do you think is the most important contribution that forests make to food security and nutrition? That's our next question. And while, while you guys are answering that, I'm gonna ask our panelists some of your questions. So the, I think the question that got the most votes is, how could forest contribution to food security and food production provide prosperity to smallholder farmers? So um, I guess I will direct that to Terry Sunderland, our first speaker. So Terry, how could the contribution of forests to food security and food production provide prosperity to smallholder farmers? Monica, could you take that off the screen for now and then we'll come back to it? Thanks. Okay, well, thanks, Amy. Um, that's probably the <laughs> toughest question there is. Um, <laughs> I mean, ultimately, um, we have to be cognizant of the role of smallholder farmers and estimates of, of global food production produced in smallholder um, systems in landscape mosaics range from 35% to 60%. So a not insignificant amount of food uh, generated in the world is, is, is grown by uh, smallholder producers, but they get almost no support in terms of um, agricultural extension, subsidies, um, a market access. Um, and when you compare Sort of western farmers with the levels of subsidies that are provided to to produce food on a monocultural basis these smallholder farmers who are working in these landscape mosaics get almost no support and in fact are, are sort of hamstrung by the the demonization of shifting agriculture the small-scale agricultural systems uh, that are pervasive in many of the sort of forest agricultural frontiers so it needs a, a sort of paradigm shift in in, in moving towards um, understanding the, the, the role of smallholder farmers, the contribution they make to global food security, uh, not just in terms of production, but in terms of diversity and resilience, and, and it bringing them into the fold in terms of the more formal agricultural sector. And the last point uh, that needs to be made there is about the, the increasing feminization of farming, that the, uh, women farmers especially are completely uh, almost cut out of the equation in terms of extension services, um, and, and other sort of forms of support. So there needs to be a, a much greater focus on, on uh, gender components of smallholder agricultural production, but also on recognizing the contribution of such systems to the global food system. Great. I knew you'd give a great answer to that, Terry. That's why I gave it to you. Thank you. Um, so um, Leandro, what do you think are the risks that deforestation um, holds for food security and nutrition, either from your work or, or in general? I mean, I guess like Terry just alluded to, that there are several facets to this issue. Um, I'm thinking when you asked the question to Terry, uh, I remembered of uh, Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy, um, for those that are not familiar with it, is basically just the, the conceptualization that people need at the most basic level food, war, uh, water, rest, and other things to survive. They also need to be in a place that is safe and secure. And, and once they have that, they obviously would also appreciate to have intimate relationships, friends, and, and you know, ultimately, if they have all those things, they can um, achieve uh, things that, like uh, self-actualization um if we start losing forests and we start losing nutrients in the soils and fish in the water and food becomes of lower quality and in, you know becomes scarce you, you can possibly have uh you know a sustainable human population 
from you know from a social economic and environmental perspective and, and that ultimately it just will not work out I'm not sure Great, if yeah, yeah, no, it was, a, it was a really nice answer. Thanks so much, Leandro. Um, so let's now go to see the audience's responses on the Slido. What do, you, what do you all think is the most important contribution that FARs make to food security and nutrition? And there's a follow-up on Slido, if you don't mind answering it while we're talking about these. Um, so the most important seems to be, yeah, so that's the follow-up question. Can we, yeah, thank you, Monica. So the most important um, contribution according to the audience is diversity. That forests bring diversity. Um, so both biodiversity I see in small, and I'm guessing people also mean dietary diversity. I see nutritional diversity, exercise, indirect effects like climate regulation. So the ecosystem services that we heard about, ecosystem services, resilience, which is great. That's what we're gonna be talking about in the second half of the session. Variety, so I guess that's similar to diversity, still not revealed. So I guess we still need to be doing more research. Wild fruits, wild foods, safety net, carbon dioxide, healthy soil, um, so it sounds like the, it sounds like people are covering lots of the different aspects that we talked about today. Um, so that's, that's great. Um, I'm interested in seeing the follow up question to see if anybody's perspective changed. Um, oh, people haven't voted on that yet. So the follow up question was did the answer to that previous question. Yeah, was that the same that you would have given before before this session. <laughs> okay. So most people are saying yes. So it doesn't look like we've it doesn't look like we've changed people's minds. Some people's minds. So maybe we're sort of preaching to the converted. No, some people have been changing their perspectives. So that's great. Okay. So um, um, I hope that. Um, you all walk away from the session convinced about the important roles that forests and trees play in food security and nutrition. And most importantly, we hope that you'll help us to communicate those benefits to other people. Because despite all of the examples and the evidence that we've shown you today, these roles are still not visible enough. So I want to thank all of our panelists for their excellent presentations, FT and GLF staff for their support to make all of this possible and the audience members for your great participation in the slidos and the questions that you asked. Sorry, we didn't get to answer more questions, um, but thanks for sharing the questions that you did, and at least we were able to answer some of them. Don't forget that there's part two to this session that's gonna be starting in, I believe, 15 minutes. Uh, Deki, do you wanna say something about the, the, next part of the, the next part of the session, of the FTA session, or maybe Vincent? Yes, um, hello Amy and, and, and thanks for, for the very nice session. Uh, and yes, in, 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 a, in a minute, uh, in 15 minutes from now, stay tuned. Uh, please go, there are two sub session room. I think please go to the main room uh, if you are online watching through Google because this is where it will take place. And uh, we will discuss uh, the impact of COVID-19 crisis on food systems, but also how it can uh, reveal what forest trees and agroforestry can practically play uh, to increase the resilience uh, of food systems. Some of these aspects have been also touched uh, in this session and, and, and we'll go and look at, uh, at other perspectives. Um, so see you in 15 minutes. Great. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye. 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 See you again. Thanks Bye. for watching. Bye. Thanks to everybody. Bye. 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 -bye. Okay, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you're tuning in from. Uh, welcome to this 
second half of the session uh, organized by FTA. This afternoon, we've got a, a, a good number of speakers lined up for you, uh, and we hope to have a very interesting discussion. We've got 400 and uh, above 400 people tuned in at the moment. Hopefully, we'll get a few more people coming on board. Uh, without wasting any time, we'll, we'll start off with an introductory session uh, uh, talk from uh, Dr. Vincent Gitz, who's the director of the forestry and agroforestry research program of the CGIAR, uh, based in, in C4. Vincent, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And uh, welcome again, uh, everyone, for the second part of, of, of this session. Uh, and uh, we want to start with the crisis, but go a little bit beyond and see what it means in terms of building resilience uh, for food systems and livelihoods. As we've seen, the, the, the COVID-19 crisis, the epidemic itself, but also the measures that countries have adopted to contain and mitigate the epidemic have had considerable impacts on our societies, economies, livelihood all over the world. And, and just to take three examples along, along food value chains, you know, some of the risk to production because workers cannot travel to the field uh, because of the infections, uh, for example, in transformation plants as well, uh, sometimes at key stages of, of food transformation. There's been also risk to food and seed production. Often bees need to be transported uh, to, to, to guarantee pollinization, and there it couldn't be done. Uh, there are also, as we've seen, many uh, disruption in food supplies chain with the paradox of empty food shelves in supermarket, while at the same time, a lot of food, fruits, vegetable, milk was thrown away by farmers because uh, the supply chains for collective catering have stopped and they cannot be easily redirected to satisfy household demand. So, COVID-19 and the policy response are putting in light two important issues uh, for us. First, it, it vividly exposed a series of vulnerabilities uh, of our societies, economies, and livelihoods. Most of these vulnerabilities are not new. We knew them from other risks, shocks and crises. We knew from that that they existed and that they were just amplified by the COVID-19 crisis. The second point is that uh, the crisis vividly recalled that we need a systemic and not a linear approach to, to food. Food systems are by nature ecological, economic, social, with interaction between these dimensions and between scales. Risks do cascade, effects interconnect. Impact of a shock can be either amplified or reduced depending on, on interconnection. And responses need to be multiple and based on an understanding on how the system reacts. The COVID-19 crisis that not only calls for a specific analysis of its impact and how to address them, it invites to a broader reflection on how to increase resilience of communities, societies, economies, and livelihood to any type of risk. And, and we believe that such a reflection can help address the present crisis and prepare for further one. Forestry and agroforestry have played an important role in buffering risk of various nature, natural, economic, and even political, both in agroecosystem and in social systems. There is a breadth of knowledge on how forests and systems with trees, including landscapes and value chains, can be managed to better address risks and to increase resilience of communities and livelihoods to shock shocks and Vincent, we, we kind of lost you a bit. Um, uh, someone muted me. It was not me, but uh, I was muted. Okay. But okay. I could act, so I'm sorry for that. Can you just wrap up, please? Yeah, um, wrap up. Sorry I, about uh, that. I don't yeah. know when you lost me, but I was just trying to say that what we mean to do here is to put together the knowledge uh, from experts, but also actors in, on the ground to identify means by which we can build resilience of food systems and livelihoods to the current crisis but in more generic term, because what this crisis has shown, it has just shown this, the spectrum of risks that we need, in fact, to, to mitigate and to address. And this is, in fact, what's going to get us also better prepared for you know, other crises uh, that, we, that, we've, that we know are, are, are coming or are already uh, upon us, uh, et cetera. So over, over to you. 
Okay, thanks a lot, Vincent. Very interesting points there. Um, we, we'll just proceed with the session and we can come back to you, your thoughts a little bit at some point. Uh, we, um, ladies and gentlemen, we do have a Slido session that we will be uh, uh, working on at least at two points during this, this presentation. So can, if you can log on to, to Slido, you have a slide in front of you on how you can log on to Slido. Uh, uh, and then you in, in, introduce the code and, and pick the FTA Orange Room, and then you can participate in the Slido. So I'll, I'll turn it over to, uh, we we'll give you a minute to link in on, on Slido, and then we can, we can put up the, the Slido question and you can respond. I hope you're getting on to Slido already. Um, can we launch then the question, please? Uh, it looks like we're having, oh, okay, great. We've got now, so we've got the, our first Slido, which was, the question was name the risk to food systems in, in food security and nutrition. And we've got climate change featuring as um, the biggest one. And then we've got deforestation, we've got uh, unsustainability, we've got climate crisis, uh, lots of things coming up. Let's see what happens. Climate risks featuring there. Population coming up, monocropping coming up as something, profit, uh, capitalism, low economy, food wastage. Quite a, a, a cloud of things really popping up, but we can see the three big things, climate change, deforestation, unsustainable production, climate risks, profit is getting bigger and bigger, uh, climate risks. Interesting, interesting things coming up there. They can be destroyed if we don't take care of them. It's some, something that came up as well. Uh, homogenization of foods, drought, access, land tenure, floods, inequality is coming up. Okay, I think I think we've got we've got quite an interesting cloud there that we can deal with, and I'm sure that a lot of these things uh, our speakers are going to be speaking to. So I, I think we will we can uh, at this point move uh, on to our next session if uh, the technical team allows. Thank you very much. Um, so we our next sub session will have four um, three speakers. Uh, that will speak to us about food systems in crisis and what, what about trees, what can trees uh, do. So we have um, um, uh, Francois Roof from, from uh, CIRAD, who's going to be talking to us about the impact of COVID-19 on the Cocoa Valley chain in, in, in Ivory Coast. Um, who's going to start us off? And then Huria, Judy from C4 is going to talk to us about tree resilience in the Sahel. And our last speaker for this sub-session will be uh, Trees for Refugees by Clement Okia from Uganda. So we'll start off with Francois straight away uh, and hear about COVID-19 and cocoa in Cote d'Ivoire. Over to you, Francois. Thanks. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot, Mr. Chairman. Um, okay, so, well, as you, as you certainly know, uh, cocoa is... Uh, is a main uh, driver of deforestation uh, in West Africa. Um, and uh, being, a, being the main driver, uh, it's also in, in charge or responsible uh, to a certain extent of certain components of the climate change, not all, but probably some. Um, farmers, are increasingly aware of this impact of the climate change and the deforestation on the climate change. And, 
and but they were much much more aware than uh, than uh, some experts or some uh, policymakers think, uh, including a chocolate company uh, staff. Um, but they were until recently, uh, and they did took and they did take some some initiatives to reintroduce some trees, uh, including food trees. It, it's not not new. Uh, they have been reintroducing, introducing and reintroducing food trees uh, in uh, many regions of Cote d'Ivoire, uh, at least uh, uh, since the 90s. Uh, but they are hampered by, uh, by uh, the jurisdiction, by, by the law, and the, by a long practice of uh, eliminating farmers from the value of, of timber. So farmers have no interest to keep timber trees or trees uh, native from the forest because they, they fear and they rightly fear that loggers, uh, local and illegal loggers will come by night to their farms and, and destroy the plantation to take off the, the timber. And they are, this practice is uh, widely accepted uh, by the governments uh, because the government structure also take uh, something from this industry. So for the farmers are the losers. Um, it's changing very slowly. Theoretically, the law is changing. But uh, before the farmers are all aware of the change in the law and the, the, their capacity to have the law respected, uh, it may take uh, a few more years. So that's the background. Now the COVID-19. Um, cocoa is a, is a main driver of deforestation, but cocoa is also an international market with large companies and huge interests. Uh, and this probably explains that, that the cocoa sector, the cocoa value, value chain in itself did not suffer much. Um, I'm working in, a, in 10 villages uh, squatted in the wool cocoa zone of Cote d'Ivoire, and only two villages mention a, a problem of, uh, of purchase of cocoa, huh? a delay in the purchase, and in, there is a slight delay in the payment, but cocoa is paid. So this is uh, much better than uh, other value chains like uh, such as uh, rubber. Rubber is suffering a lot. So rubber was already in very bad conditions before the COVID-19 with a very low price and it's aggravated. Francois, can you, can you wrap up, Francois, please? Sorry? Pardon? Can, 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 can you wrap can up, please? Can you wrap, wrap up? up? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, Wrap up. Okay, 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 wrap up. <laughs> bon. yeah. Compared to rubber and cashew, uh, uh, cocoa is in a better condition. So cocoa farmers keep worrying about the future, but for the time being, they are not that in that bad conditions in terms of payments and, and, and cocoa revenues. Regarding uh, the other aspects, especially food security, uh, as, I, as I said before, Farmers have been planting fruit trees for decades, and they keep planting. And uh, there is a change in the use of these uh, fruit trees. Initially, farmers planted fruit trees just as a, a kind of landmarker, and maybe to have a few fruits, a few fruits when they work in the in the cocoa farm. But with the with two two or three more decades later, there is a change. Uh, Cocoa, cocoa, are, cocoa trees are aging, so they tend to replace and to, to densify, uh, to increase the density of fruit trees to replace the cocoa because the replanting of cocoa is difficult. Uh, also, you have an increase uh, in the demand because the population. Yeah. Uh, Francois, I think we need to, uh, you need to stop because you. Hello, um, thanks, Francois. I think we'll have to transition to. Huria, unfortunately, I'm sorry, I know your story is interesting, but we need to transition to Huria uh, and, and uh, who's going to talk about tree resilience in the Sahel. Um, before she starts, can you please, audience, if you have any questions, just type them in, in, in Wuva, um, and we will pick those questions after our three speakers. I'm sorry, Francois, but we just need to move to, to uh, uh, Huria. Huria, please, can you... Huria is, is a scientist at C4. Can you please talk yes. to us about for resilience in the Sahel, please? Thanks. 
Yes, thank you. Thank you, Peter. So uh, I would like today to share some uh, key messages or experiences we had in, in the FTA work and adaptation in Israel. And um, uh, I would like actually to, to talk about the role of trees in the time of crisis. We do know that trees uh, contribute in an interesting way to uh, income. We also know that in some times of crisis, people use trees direct uh, direct consumption. But what we didn't know is that what is the link actually between the food security buying food because people when their granaries in Sahel are empty they have to buy uh, food so how do they get the income to buy food so what we looked at and uh, that was a study with some colleagues from Sirat and with a PhD student uh, Christophe and uh, Denis Gauthier from Sirat and we used uh, a very sad time a uh, crisis time like this time in Burkina Faso which was a very very dry year and we used uh, this set time to do some uh, analysis to look at how people are coping actually in this time of crisis, what they are selling, what they are buying. And we looked actually particularly to women too, because in this area, in the Sahel, women are the ones who are responsible for food security in the household. So we actually looked at a, a range of, of uh, forest and tree products and two of them come out from this study as being very significant in the correlation they have to the fact that people sell them in the time of crisis to buy food, to have access to food. One of them is the, the wood fuel and the second one is the shea nut. I'm sure a lot of you know about the shea tree and its importance in, in the Sahel. So what we figured out actually is that people who had access, who were able to sell the, the shea, uh, shea nut were less likely to have a, to have a, a a crisis or a food, a food insecurity uh, disaster. And this correlation was very strong. But at the same time, what we, we saw is that this is not the role of trees in time of crisis. I said so not something which is absolutely uh, a kind of the same every time. The rules are changing and a lot of things are changing. And so we looked in another study about how other groups in the community are using, what are their coping strategies and how do they use tree products to adapt in time of crisis. And one interesting result was that we saw increasingly more young men who are cutting actually she trees to sell them as charcoal. So this is their adaptive strategy. So when we think about the first, uh, uh, the first part of the story, I was telling you women selling the nut, and then the second part, men selling the charcoal from the same tree, we have here something, uh, some kind of overlapping of uh, adaptive strategies in terms of crisis, which makes the situation very complex because this means for the women that they cannot sell the, the Shia nuts. And here there is this kind of trade-offs we need to understand when we look at the role of trees and the role of, of their product in, terms, in times of crisis, we need to understand the trade-offs between the users and how their access to these trees uh, change during this time. And so just to finish, because I think my time is- Yes, you're wrapping over. up, please, thanks. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, I think the one issue which is very important to look at is not only at the role of the product, but also at the equality and the inequalities in the access to these very important uh, food trees and food resources. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Really good timekeeping there, Huria, and great points on, on, on gender and stuff like that. Thank you. We'll come back to that. Keep, keep typing in your questions in Uva. We'll get back to those in, in a bit. Uh, we get to Clement, who will talk to us about trees for refugees in, in, in Uganda. Clement, over to you, please. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Peter and, and, and the listeners. I'm, I'm glad to share with you about um, uh, trees for refugees uh, using the case of Uganda. Uh, one of the things that we discovered was similar to what has been shared on the role of trees with refugees. But the main concern in our study, in our work was that uh, normally when refugees go into a country, they are settled in marginal places and then forest trees and generally the environment is disseminated. For the case of Uganda, we, we have now about 1.4 million refugees. And these are settled, I mean, these refugees are mainly coming from South Sudan, Democratic Republic of Congo and other neighboring countries. And so they are settled in those marginal landscapes and the increase of the population as a result of refugee influx, together with the host community, 
really removes most of the tree cover in, in, in the landscape. Uganda has one of the most progressive refugee policies in the, in, in the world with refugees allocated a plot of land for a homestead and also for farming. And so it was possible for us to demonstrate that even refugees can grow trees. So we started engagement in 2017. We did a lot of, lots of assessment on say, for example, the rate of biomass removal from refugee uh, settlements. And then we demonstrated like, if we go as on business as usual scenario, we would have all the tree biomass wiped out in about four years. And with the refugees and the host community, this kind of analysis and also the soil analysis to show the, the rate of degradation was enough. To we had a, a lot of community engagements selecting what kind of trees they would want to plant and mainly trees for food. Refugees were interested in growing trees like Moringa Olifera for, uh, for a vegetable. And then also we put in a mechanism that provided the planting materials for tree growing. And then we also established what we call the Community Learning and Innovation Center, where they would get the training, where they would get the materials and all the information required for tree planting. We also worked on the shear nut and the desert date to, and, the, and, and the honey to develop what we call the nutrition sensitive uh, value chains, which were able to earn money to refugees and host communities. And this all uh, sort of catalyzed uh, tree growing uh, with refugees. And when, when we did that, we, we then moved into uh, the kind of outcomes that we got, for example, is that adoption of agroforestry was substantially increased among refugees and host communities. We also had uh, the, the, the building capacity of the local kind of structures because we have what we call refugee welfare councils and then the, the, the local community have what we call the local council. So these were empowered into how to engage the different sets of people in tree growing. And we also demonstrated that you need to integrate tree growing with the other interventions like energy and livelihoods. And we also demonstrated that you need to integrate environmental restoration into refugee program right from the beginning of the interventions because most of the refugee situations are not just emergency. Clement, they, they, you, might need to, that, you might need to wrap up, please. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Most of the refugee stations are protracted. They last about 10 uh, to 15 years. So we have been able to restore about three refugee settlements and we have integrated these interventions together with the other intervention. So we have really shown that trees are integral in the livelihoods of the refugees in terms of non-wood forest products and poles and fuel wood. And this can be integrated together with energy and environment response. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Clement. Um, um, we'll just take maybe one or two questions from the, the lot that we have and direct to, to specific people. We, we are having a few questions online uh, as we speak. So there is one that talks about um, um, what are some barriers towards mainstreaming forest foods? I'll, I'll pass that on to, to Huria, maybe just to give a 30 second response. What are the main barriers to forest foods? 30 seconds, please. Uh, please, can you can you uh, repeat the question? What are the main barriers towards mainstreaming forest foods? Well, it's a very interesting question. Thank you. I think the, I think uh, if I look at the areas where I work, I see a lot of local people are, are using uh, a lot of uh, forest uh, product in direct use in uh, consumption. But the problem is that at the at the policy level, those products are not a part of the of the diet or a part of the programs policies are actually working uh, with. And I think there is a, a discrepancy between what is happening at the local level, particularly in terms of crisis and what policies are. So uh, there is a there is a lot of work to do. To, to bring those products, to give them value, to value them as other products at the policy level and at the market level. But I see also in many countries that there is a, a kind of move to this direction. Like I see in West Africa, for instance, a lot of uh, people who are living in the city are starting discovering 
the food coming from you know from the village where they were as as a yeah. as child yeah. mm. in Bali. Mm. Okay, good. Th thanks a lot. Uh, the next question for Francois, please. Uh, Francois, uh, people are asking, someone is asking, uh, there are quite a number of questions for you, but one of the interesting questions is, uh, can agroforestry replace monocultures completely, even for massive food production, in, 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 based on what you were talking about? And some people even added that, how can we increase tree stocks in cocoa production landscapes? Well, um, regarding food production, uh, agroforestry cannot do uh, miracles. Uh, we will still need, uh, uh, like in uh, the, the Asian model with uh, lowland area cultivated in, uh, in uh, with rice, and uh, we we really need that. We, we cannot do everything with agroforestry. The, 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 the food component of agroforestry system is relatively limited uh, with cocoa. You can grow, uh, as I said, you can grow fruits, uh, fruit trees. You, well, you, you cannot grow, uh, you cannot produce uh, cereals. Uh, you cannot, well. so regarding food, no. Agroforestry cannot do, is, will not, never be sufficient. Now, can agroforestry replace monoculture? It depends, again, uh, how we, what is the definition of agroforestry? Huh? It, it's uh, the, always the same question. If, uh, if you define agroforestry by uh, having uh, two or three species uh, per hectare, uh, then uh, all the cocoa in, uh, in West Africa is, is a kind of agroforestry. Uh, okay. you, you, in average, you, you may even have maybe 10 non-cocoa species per hectare uh, okay. average, mm. with a few okay. individuals. Mm -hmm. okay. But yeah, it's, it's, it's progressing by itself because farmers mm. are aware that they need more trees to, to fight the, the, the deforestation and to mm. fight the climate change. And in addition, maybe for the very first time, cho the chocolate industry is doing something useful by uh, okay. helping Thank farmers you. to reintroduce trees. Thanks a lot, Francois. Thanks. Very, very, very good, good responses. I, I like them. Thank you. Um, we'll, we'll turn to our next group of speakers um, at this point that will be talking about trees for resilient farming systems, landscapes and households. Um, and here we have four really eloquent speakers, all of them I know very well. Um, Eduardo Somariba from Katie, who will be talking to you about Trees, a security for small farmers in Central America. Uh, and then we have the potential for, of agroecology to increase resilience of food systems. That would be by uh, Fergus Sinclair from ECRAF. And then we have ecosystem-based adaptation from uh, Lalisa Duguma from ECRAF as well. And Bamboo for Food Security and Livelihood Development by Durai. Uh, uh, Jayaraman from uh, Inba, based in, in China. So we'll, we'll go in that order, and I'll just, without wasting any time, ask uh, uh, Eduardo to please take, take it on and, and tell us about security for food security for smallholder farmers in Central America. Thanks, Eduardo. Thank you very much, Peter. <clears throat> Thank you very much, everybody. A pleasure to be here. We have only a very few minutes to talk about the subject. So in this time, I will argue that the trees on farms are commonplace, are everywhere, that are very much valuable for security to rural households, but they are invisible. And because they're invisibility, they are suboptimally used. This is more of the, the main argument of this of the talk. I will start saying that when you look at the lower classification of forests of FAO, you have the forest other woodland, and then you have land that are not forest or woodland. And in those areas, you find trees on farm. You know, all the trees outside the forest, and outside trees outside the forest can be classified in three different groups. It can be in urban setting, it can be in some specific ecosystem with low tree density, or in the farm. And when you look at the trees on the farm, there is a, a very important study conducted by Sommer and others in. Uh, 1929 uh, and then 2014, looking at the distribution of tree cover in the agricultural landscape worldwide. This has been a study that is, is being debated 
Kitley by the scientific community, but it has uh, spurred a lot of discussion and consideration showing that the, the, the trees in the, in the agricultural fields are commonplace, they are everywhere. Just to give you a figure, they say that about 23% of all the agricultural land in the world has 20% or less tree cover. And, and this 20% cover means that for every hectare, you have about 2,000 square meters of canopy cover. And you can use that for production, for shading, for fodder. And it's a, there's a great possibility to manipulate this 20% cover. When you look at closely at this 20%, then you see, you know, you find those trees in pasturelands, in lay fences, in home gardens, in fallow system, planted in, in line fences, in woodlots, and so on and so forth. And the complexity of the management and the design of the system is, is incredible. And the important thing is that <clears throat> when you look at this complexity, look at this diversity and all this management that farmers already do to this system, they produce a lot of goods for the farmers. They, they provide a lot of uh, food and material, raw material for self-consumption, including nutritious food, especially the fruits no? that are rich in vitamins, but also they are available at times of hunger, all those hunger monks that you find in many dry places, those are fulfilled mostly with fruits that are available at specifically those times. So they are very valuable for that. They are valuable for cash crop, for cash flow, also a saving account, you know, if this is your cow, no? you have, you, if you are a cattle rancher, you have a cow, have a problem, sell a cow. Here, you have a problem, you have a tree, take your tree, sell your tree and uh, reduce your vulnerability, no? And also, we got the benefit of all the ecosystem services they provide. Despite all these benefits, uh, it's, it's the, the potential is still suboptimal. We are not really realizing the full potential because um, there are many factors involved. Just, just to give you an example, we are conducting studies in Honduras in cattle ranches. We surveyed 25,000 hectares in line plantings. And then we realized that the in, in this Honduras has 2 million hectares of pasture lands and 70 meters of line plantings per hectare gives you 140,000 kilometers of line plantings. Eduardo, the, can you wrap up, please? Yeah. Yeah. But the thing is that there is a great potential. Huh? You can turn this 140,000 kilometers into 140,000 hectares of timber plantation, but pro proper management. The point is that despite all these benefits, they are invisible. They are not in the most of the legislation in many countries. We don't find trees outside the forest or an agroforestry legislation well developed. If there is no legislation, there are not institutions. So where do you go in the Ministry of Agriculture to talk about trees on farms? Uh, they are not in the public and private policies to support planting trees and using trees in the farm. And they are not in the curricula uh, for extension services. So we need to increase the visibility, develop better legal institutional policy framework, include trees on farm in the curricula at the university level, but also at the farming field school program, and also do whatever we have to do to change this mindset. Hey, Eduardo, I'm on for, I think we will have to we'll have to stop you at this point. I'm really sorry. You say trees as crops. That's that's the idea. Okay. Thank, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Um, sorry about that, but but we need to we need to manage time. I'm really sorry. Um, Fergus, maybe you yeah, can I, talk to us a little bit about agroecology, please. Thanks. Yeah, I'm really disappointed because I was, uh, uh, I'm sure Eduardo was saying much more exciting things than I will. But uh, <laughs> agroecology uh, is very much uh, the essence of FTA and particularly the livelihood systems flagship within it, because mm -hmm. it's about ending uh, poverty and hunger uh, while also uh, protecting life on land, regenerating um, rather than further degrading the environment. So that's finding ways of farming that are in harmony with nature um, and are socially equitable. And uh, trees are critical for agroecology because they uh, provide functional diversity, a great uh, uh, addition of functional diversity to uh, agriculture, which allows uh, ecosystem services to be maintained at the same, the, uh, the same time 
um, as food production. Now, last year, in 2019, um, the Livelihood Systems flagship was instrumental in two key uh, international reports. The high-level panel of experts of the uh, UN Committee on World Food Security Report on Agroecology and the Global Commission on Adaptation Report. The great thing about the HLPE report is that it has been, it has been accepted as the basis of poli a policy convergence process. Now that's a big step forward for agroecology because until now there's tended to be objections uh, to taking it on board and getting beyond that polarization of either being for or against agroecology, but actually looking at how we can put it into practice on a large scale um, um, is a huge step forward. And there are four things from the uh, report which, which are really important. The first was the development of consolidated principles of agroecology in line with the FAO 10 elements, but there are 13 clearly stated principles. And that allows you to understand the overlaps and distinctions with other approaches, like sustainable uh, intensification, for example. And those distinctions uh, are important. Their third element is metrics and the need for better, more inclusive metrics of agricultural systems, the performance of agriculture, in order for agroecology to be judged on a leving, level playing field uh, with other approaches. And fourthly, the importance of agency. The extent to which people in food systems, and that's consumers as well as producers, processors, uh, and so on, are able to determine uh, the uh, way in which food is produced, uh, uh, processed, stored, and sold. Now, we're moving from that theoretical analysis of the existing evidence to practice. And we've set up, um, together with partners, a transformative partnership platform on agroecological transition that already received uh, funding from the French government to look at the performance, socioeconomic viability and adoption of agroecological practices uh, across Africa. And this is addressing now key evidence and implementation gaps um, uh, in, in uh, agroecology through can the development can, can you, of can you common approaches. Up, That's my last word. Yes, please. Oh, great. Perfect. Very good timing, Fergus. Really on the time. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Very good. Good points. Very, very concise. Um, we'll move on to Lalisa Duguma on ecosystem-based adaptation. Please keep putting on your questions and we'll pick them up and, 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 and address them to, to the speakers uh, right after the, the, the fourth speaker. Thanks. Lalisa, please, over to you. Hi, Lalisa. Okay, maybe we go to Durai and we can Durai. see Durai. Come uh, Okay. Good. Sorry, I was okay. muted by someone. Yeah, I'll okay. be talking about ecosystem-based adaptation using a typical case uh, project that we are implementing currently in the Gambia, which is large-scale ecosystem-based adaptation. And when we think about ecosystem-based adaptation, what comes to our mind is very often about the ecosystem, about the climate change, about the people, and how do we link these three different pieces together with the governance of the ecosystems into one basket so that it generates the benefit that it ought to generate. And the benefit from ecosystem depends on how good we manage the ecosystem. That's typically how good we maintain the ecosystem health. If ecosystem health is degraded, then there are no ecosystem services, then the adaptive capacity of the local communities who depend on this thing will be lower because communities largely depend on ecosystems for their survival in most of the rural areas. So a particular case which I would really like to bring to your attention is where we selected one community forest who are living very close to a community protected area. And this community, every year they are losing a lot of their production, typically the crop production. And the main cause for that loss is the monkeys and other animals coming out of the protected areas. So we went into this space asking them, so what shall we do? And 
one of the key things they suggested was to talk to the park managers. We spoke with them and they said, okay, why do the monkeys come to the farm areas? Because the trees which provide the fruits that the monkeys depended on before are actually harvested for timber and charcoal. So we took back this information to the community and said, okay, you guys are living in a very constrained environment where there is a lot of limitation in terms of rainfall and production systems. How do we cope with these drought situations? How do you cope with this loss of production and with the severe impact of climate change often manifesting? So the suggestion between the communities and the community park managers was actually to enrich the forest area with tree species that could actually provide the fruit that the monkeys could depend on. So this is where it comes to really making the blocks complete because if we are able to enrich the forest with those trees that provide the fruits for the monkeys, in fact, we reduce the intensity of monkey invasion on the crops. For some of us, this may not look like a climate change related thing, but these people are producing these crops in a very constrained environment where there is very limited amount of rainfall every year. So for them, the big concern is how do we reduce this loss due to the animals that are coming out so that we can live off these crops that we are producing. So in a nutshell, what is the big message here? When we think about ecosystem-based adaptation, we need to think outside the box because there are a lot of variables that need to be taken into account for us to be more effective, successful, and resource efficient. Thanks so much. Thanks, Lalisa. Right on time. I think more, much uh, slightly below under time. That's really good. Thank you very much. Very exciting stories there uh, that I know. Uh, maybe we go straight on to Durai to talk about bamboo and for food security and livelihood development. Over to you, Durai. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much, Chair. So I think like uh, most of us know that like bamboos are like woody grasses, but grows in about like 30 million hectares in the tropics and like subtropical parts of the world. And it is also like one of the fastest growing plant. And uh, once we plant it, it gets like matured in three to five years. After that, it is like ready for annual harvesting without deforestation or degradation. Yeah, this is one of the important part of like bamboo. So bamboo shoots are an important food item for numerous communities in Asia and in Africa. And it is like one of the important globally traded like commodity as well. About 300 million US dollar worth of like bamboo shoots are traded and it can play an important role for like food and nutrition security. In addition to that, like bamboo apes are an important feed and fodder for like cattle. So it also like enhances the resilience of the farmer. So in addition to that, uh, with technological innovation, with like a wide range of applications, it can be a very important tool for uh, bringing like people out of like poverty. In bamboo poles shoot, in addition to the, the sustainable, in addition to the sustenance use of farmer, it can also provide an annual income for the farmer as an insurance for him. And then the value addition of the bamboo poles and shoots in numerous products can uh, provide employment and jobs and income for households in form of small and medium scale enterprises and industries. And enterprise can be set up with like without investment as well as with uh, like billions of dollars of investment in the case of like bamboo. I would still like to state two cases from India in like one of the project uh, in China, Guangzhou province, like Inbar and like some SDC project. The project focused on improving the management technique of the farm, uh, which like some enhanced the production of the bamboo yield from hands per hectares to like some 17 tons per hectare in an year and the shoot yield increased from two tons to like five tons per year with an increase in income of say 100 US dollar in the case of uh, the bamboo poles and like 1,200 cases in the 
a case of uh, in bamboo shoots. And then the whole supply chain, it has created huge employment for around 100,000 farmers and like value chain actors there in that province. The second example is from Allahabad, India, where bamboo is integrated with other crop, uh, crops and in cropping systems to rehabilitate the land, which is uh, degraded because of quick mining. Uh, th this project has uh, enabled around 3,000 families to come out of poverty and it has increased the soil, uh, the water table, as well as other like some environmental parameters. Zurai, can you wrap up, please? Absolutely. And then this project has been awarded uh, the Alcan Prize for like some sustainability. As conclusion, the important aspect of bamboo is like, like your environment and livelihood access. So it can contribute to like so many of the global challenges and like some sustainable development goals. I thank you for the opportunity. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Durai. Really interesting examples and, and good illustrations about what that can do for food security and nutrition in terms of integrating bamboo. Uh, we, we've got a, a few questions, uh, one or two questions only from the, 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 the group. But we'll go to Fergus, one question to Fergus is, um, you, you talked about the potential for agroecology. Can you illustrate further um, how that, that can help agroecology, agroforestry can help improve food security and nutrition, more, more specifically in terms of resilience of food systems? Well, uh, uh, one of the key principles of uh, agroecology is biodiversity, and another one is economic diversification. Um, and another is shortening uh, food chains and connecting producers and consumers better. Now, all of those three principles contribute to uh, resilience, ecologically uh, and economically. And there is now quite a body of evidence that shows good food security outcomes from the application of agroecological practices. And of course, in the longer term, you're cutting feedback, negative feedback from externalities of agriculture, reducing biodiversity and, and contributing to climate change. Eduardo, um, you, you did end up talking about policies um, and, and, and how the potential of agroforestry is huge. Um, and, and integrating trees. What examples of policies can you give uh, that can help uh, make sure that we can capture this potential? Very quickly, 30 seconds, please. It only has to do with the possibility for the farmers to really make use of the trees, no? Uh, so, and, and the fact that the trees on the farm are not the same as the trees on the forest. Making this distinction in the, in the legislation will make a big difference because most of the trees now are overregulated because you are considering like trees in the forest. Um, we lost Eduardo a bit. Um, maybe we give him a second to come back. They are in the forest, but they are regulated okay. as Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Eduardo. We missed a bit of that, but hopefully we can we can get get um, um, that. One last question that came up on this session uh, is that uh, uh, relating to demonization of shifting cultivation. So, Lalisa, some somebody was asking that shifting cultivation has been demonized a lot with respect to how it, 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 it in, in terms of its contribution to Red Plus but that it doesn't really help feed people sustainably. And how can we bring sustainable intensification into the picture? And how can we overcome this demonization when it's still very essential for, for people in, in the kinds of areas where you were talking about? 30 seconds, please, just a quick response to the question. Um, uh, I think the key thing here is uh, to really understand what is the driver of that shifting cultivation because in many instances we just associate shifting cultivation with the smallholder farmers and then the blame is always put on to them but the question is we need to also ask ourselves what have we done to help these farmers to adopt sustainable production systems 
that could actually reduce the extent of the shifting calculation. Of course, yes, it contributes to rate plus, but the main thing is how do we reduce the impact of those drivers leading to shifting cultivation by creating community awareness, by creating options for communities, livelihood strategies that could actually reduce the impact they have on the forest by doing the shifting cultivation. Unless we take interventions, I mean, shifting cultivation. Okay. okay. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Lalisa. In, in interesting responses. We'll come back if there are any questions. Keep putting your questions. We can do follow ups with specific people later on. So let's move on to our next group of speakers that will address more broadly the institutions and policies to support resilience, uh, building through trees, really looking at policies and institutions. In that group, we have some really good people that I all I know very well as well. Um, we have Alice Michugi, Muchugi from ECRAF that will talk about the role of genetic uh, retreat, genetic resources for resilience. We have Jens Peter Bernkau for uh, from the University of Copenhagen that will talk about seed and seedling systems, giving an example from Ethiopia. And we have uh, Bas Lohmann from Tropenbos uh, who will be talking about finance for greater landscape resilience. And we have uh, uh, Julia Wolf that would be looking at using uh, 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 national adaptation plan processes to increase resilience for food system with trees. Our last speaker in that session in that session would be Cecilia Jones from the Ministry of Livestock, Agriculture and Fisheries from uh, of Uruguay. She will be talking about uh, um, forest and adaptation to climate change lessons during the NAP uh, uh, agriculture process in Uruguay. So let's, without much ado, let's go to Alice uh, to take us through the three genetic resources and resilience. Alice, please. Thank you, Peter. And uh, welcome to the session. In the previous session in the afternoon, a lot of details were given on the importance of diversity for proper nutrition and good health. And it's important to note that out of the 300,000 known edible plants, only about 200 of the species are used by human. And actually only three of these contribute to about 60%. We all know of maize, the rice and the wheat. But when we come to the trees, it's the same case scenario. We only have a small percentage of the food trees contributing to the global food and nutrition. We have the avocados, the oranges, the mangoes, the apples, well known. But we do have several tree species that can contribute to the food uh, security, but they are very little known, only known to the communities in the region where these trees occur naturally. A survey done some years ago by the AOCC, by the within Red by Nepal, it came up with 100 uh, such species for Africa. And among those ones, we have about we have 51 trees which have been sh shown to have a lot of uh, the fruits to be very rich in vitamins and minerals. And of course, they are very important to the local communities where they occur. These species are rarely cultivated, and most of them are just harvested from the wild by the uh, from the forest and from the parkland. But it, it is within our knowledge what is happening and the threats that are there to the forests and the parkland. The rate of the high rate of deforestation, the, deg the degradation, and also the destruction that is there, meaning that these important genetic resources are the threat of being lost. And indeed, one out of every five plants in the world, it is thought it is it has been documented that it is threatened with extinction. While it is estimated for forty thousand tree species globally, which are already known because there are others that their importance are not known, are already threatened with extinction. These, of course, include these underutilized three species that we have mentioned above. Uh, the, there is the importance to conserve the inter and the intra species diversity and also ensure that this diversity is brought on the farm for the community to, uh, to benefit from them before it is too late. Because we already know the current problems that are associated with in situ conservation, that is at the forest where they are. Then ex situ 
means it's the only best way to have these ones conserved. And the gene banks play a big role here. Now at ICRAF, we have the, the gene bank conserving about uh, 238 uh, tropical tree species. Among these ones, 52 of them are food trees. And we also have 34, which are forages, important for livestock. And the gene bank uh, annually, it distributes over, over thousands, thousands and thousands of seeds and seedlings. And this also translates to being taken to the farmlands where they are planted. And again, on the farms, apart from providing the original or the reason why they were acquired, maybe for food, for timber, for medicinal, because the tree is long lived, it means it will be there for a long time. And this is also a one way of conservation, which we call is a conservation on the farm. Apart from conserving this, the gene banks will also look into the evaluate, will also evaluate and characterize this collection. So and provide this information so that the users will know what kind of material is there and what they use it for in terms of the quality, taste, color, as well as ecological suitability. Is it for highlands? Is it for drylands? All this information will be provided by the gene bank. But in terms of this, uh, in terms of these threats which we are currently facing, what is the role of the genetic resources? If we look back, whether it is tree crops or even the annual crops. Modern farming promotes the cultivation of improved and exotic trees. But what happens when we are improving the, uh, the trees or even the annual crops? We limit the diversity. We dilute the intraspecies diversity. And this makes the species more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, the diseases, and the pests. It cannot fight back. It's the inbreeding we hear in animals. So it means that with increased inbreeding, it means this with the, uh, with the changing climate, in, uh, the climate change impacts, the diseases coming in, it means the fight, the, the plants will be limited in the way they cope with these changes. And therefore, and of course, there are many diseases with, that the researchers have been looking into in terms of the trees and also for the- Can you wrap up, can you wrap up please? Uh, sorry, Alice, thanks. Sure, sure, sure. So in the event that such outbreaks can occur, it means that it is important that these material are conserved in the gene bank and are made available to the breeders or to the tree improvers so that they can contribute and be able to come up with species, I mean, with varieties that can cope with such calamities. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Alice. Thanks. Interesting. Let's go to Jens, Jens Peter on seed and seedling system. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah thank you. Hello everyone, so I'm Jens Peter, I'm from the University of Copenhagen, but I say I'm also a fellow at the World Agroforestry. So my topic is forest landscape tree planting, and the question I'm asking is, can we get more out of the investments? So first, agroforestry is a major part of forest landscape tree planting, and that's smallholders growing trees on the agricultural land, which as Fergus says, is very much an agroecological approach. Um, Trees produce large number of income generating crops, as we know, cocoa, coffee, rubber, timber, and also nutritious crops, mango, avocado, macadamia, and many indigenous species. But so support to tree planting has become a million dollar industry, nonprofit. And the act of tree planting is actually the smaller investment. The larger investment is by smallholders who tend the trees that will occupy their land for many years. So planted trees should therefore be of the best possible quality so as not to waste farmers' time. And what is quality? Most important aspect of quality is to describe seed sources with respect to where the trees can grow well under current and future climates and with respect to the quality of the tree products it can produce. So you can think of a commercial garden center in, for example, Europe or Japan. As a customer, you can get advice on and obtain exactly the tree that you want to grow in your garden. And you can be reasonably sure that the tree will perform and produce exactly as you have been advised. So how well a smallholder agroforestry served by the organization supporting tree planting is quality an important concern. Unfortunately, for most organizations, the target is only number of trees planted and quality is unknown. So you can check with your charity, how does it make sure that the seed sources used are suitable and will produce quality trees? That should be known all the way from the field level to the management level. Most likely your charity focused on project nurseries and collection of whatever seed is available. 
it is actually fairly straightforward to develop efficient seed and seedling input supply chains. Of course, it takes time and it requires a focus on developing sustainable networks instead of project dependent nurseries that stop functioning when project stops. There are incipient networks of decentralized private nurseries in many tropical countries surviving despite the free seedlings from project nurseries. Those networks could be strengthened by knowledge about quality and access to quality. For agricultural crops, sustainable decentralized networks are supported as seed cooperatives along with seed sources for quality crops and tree and, seedling, tree and seed seedlings networks could learn and apply. So climate appropriate portfolios of tree diversity, yes. we, we call it cat tree diversity, are developed yes, by the Peter, world. Can you wrap up, please? Yeah. Can you wrap yeah, up? developed by World Agroforestry and Government in Ethiopia. So it supports development of improved sources, medium term, and description of sources in forest and farmland for the immediate use. And uh, so this should be supplemented with strong support for decentralized networks of producers and distributors of seedlings. So in summary, tree planting investments are far from optimal. Focus should change from quantity to quality and change from short-term goals to long-term sustainability. Thank you. A lot. Thanks a lot, Jens Peter. Really interesting points there. Um, can we move on to Bas now on the finance and resilient landscapes, please? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Okay, finance, it's a complex topic. Yeah, and three minutes is very short. So I do recommend that if you are interested in this topic, then look at our website, tropomos.org. There you can read a little bit more about that and also on more recent works on the uh, impact of COVID on landscapes in the tropics, where some of the issues that were discussed here as well come up, but from the mouth of the farmers. Uh, we learned a lot about uh, about resilience of landscapes, in particularly in this recent work on the COVID-19. Money makes the world go round. Yeah, but from our work on, for example, a landscape analysis of financial flows in Indonesia, Ghana, and now also in Vietnam, we find that we do not need more money. We don't need, uh, in a, we need better money. You know, typically investments result in labor, in additional income, and sometimes also in additional food supply. Yeah, but little in improvements for the environment, improvements for water supply, or also in climate action. Yeah, and we see actually that in some of the landscapes, uh, more than 10 times as much money goes to unsustainable production or in monocropping, which not necessarily is unsustainable, but does increase the vulnerability of the farmers, also the vulnerability of the workers involved. Yeah, and that um, we have been able to confirm that also with some work on risk reducing strategies by farmers. Yeah, that much of the money that does go into the landscapes um, has a certain risk of investment, typical risks of investment, like people not paying back, yeah, or changes in um, in exchange rate, yeah, and those, but those risks are usually more or less covered. Yeah, uh, investors do run some risk, but a lot of that is run, for example, by governments which give guarantees or by insurance companies that cover the initial investments. On the other hand, when they do invest, for example, in, in things like oil palm, yeah, the activity of, of doing the oil palm, that activity is also a risk, a production risk. Yeah, uh, could be because of climate change, could be because of plagues. Yeah, could be just off uh, extreme weather conditions. Yeah, and those risks are very often not covered. Yeah, they're run by the farmers. This also we see in our preliminary work on the uh, COVID-19, yeah, where, for example, workers of oil palm plantations in Indonesia no longer can uh, work because of the restrictions on mob mobility. And so they don't have an income, but they also no longer farm, so they don't have food either. On the other hand, uh, you have farmers which uh, run uh, farms, mixed farms, where they do have some oil palm or some rubber and additional food crops. Yeah, they don't. Bas, need... can you please wrap up, please? Sorry. Yep, all that. Mm -hmm. um, so those examples you can see on your webs on our website, and that we want to know is how do we can improve that? Yeah. So we need finance in diversity and risk. It needs to be coordinated. It needs to be inclusive of all stakeholders. 
Yeah, and that needs good governance. So better finance, yeah, needs to be oriented towards that rather than trying to get more money. And that's what I want to say. That's very interesting. Not more money, but better money. So that's, that's good. Thank you. Um, can we go to Julia Wolf from FAO on NAP processes? Please? Sure, thank you. Um, so I'm very pleased to be uh, invited to the session and um, uh, I'd like to start from a point of view of, of saying that I've been leading the implementation of a larger program in 11 countries over the last five years that try to address agriculture sectors integration so that means crops, livestock, uh, forestry, and fishery in national adaptation plan processes. So I'm, I'm arguing from a policy point of view, which we heard earlier, like from Eduardo on over-regulations or from Alice on, on um, gene banks and the importance of biodiversity, uh, keeping up the diversity of seeds. So I'd just like to flag a couple of points. Um, on the role um, and, and the importance of creating and sustaining and, and enabling policy setting to achieve a lot of uh, the things we've been speaking about. Um, and I'd, I'd like to propose that the national adaptation plan process is actually a very interesting vehicle that looks at medium to long term planning processes from um, addressing climate change in particular, but also um, kind of embracing the, the, the issues we are facing now with COVID, um, which means like what, what does the system do and how does the system respond and in particular, since we're talking here about food systems, how can we prepare food systems to respond to crisis, but not only to crisis such as COVID, but actually also addressing climate change and how that um, is an opportunity um, to, to elevate the, the invisible as we had uh, from an earlier speaker today, the invisibility of forest trees, agroforestry system and, and forest dependent people. Um, so one of the, the things, um, I'll just maybe quickly to explain the NAP process. So the NAP process is coming out of a 2010 decision from parties in the UNFC process and the Cancun adaptation framework that is mostly addressing these developed countries, but also developing countries medium to long term needs to respond to climate change. Um, and one of the first steps of this process is actually vulnerability analysis. Um, and that's one of my key points I'd like to make here, because if, if you look at uh, the vulnerability assessment or if the vulnerability assessments have been, would have been done more properly in, in developing countries, like really um, doing an assessment of what are the key gaps to build adaptive capacity, to build resilience, um, not only in planning processes, but, but building responsive solutions, then we would have been also better prepared on COVID in some way. Um, I'd like to quickly uh, flag um, like a publication that has been launched together with Peter, you may remember that at COP25. Um, so FAO and FTA launched a framework on addressing vulnerability of forest and forest dependent people at, uh, at COP in Madrid. Um, last year and it is available in the, in the references of, of um, in the concept note for this session. Um, so that's just something um, in terms of a very rich resources where you can look if you're interested to better understand what we're proposing there, um, how to go about in a, in a step approach. Uh, why is it such an opportunity is because when you do vulnerability assessment, of course, you look at the risks like um, and not only the, the uh, nature system risk, but actually also the socioeconomic risks. Um, and what would be a potential um, impact of climate change. And why is that important? And, and Vincent said it in the beginning. I mean, you talked about uh, the need to have a more systemic way, right? Because often we, we, we start from a local level, which is, which is important, but unless we understand how really in, in a systemic way vulnerability can be reduced, it will be too ad hoc. And this is why um, I care so much about talking about this framework of the national adaptation plans and the potential it has. Um, it's also important not to Julia, look at- can you, yeah, Julia, can up. you wrap up? Yes, please, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's also important not to look at, at um, in terms of um, an immediate response, but actually a longer term response. And uh, we also launched, uh, we will in July 20, uh, 2020, together with FAA, we will actually launch a publication that addresses how uh, how to integrate forest trees and agroforestry in the national adaptation plans. You will have that available, and and I'm really pleased now to hear from Cecilia 
um, on a concrete case in Uruguay. Uh, we've been working with Uruguay for the last. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Julia. Um, so let's go to uh, uh, Cecilia with a very concrete case. I'm really excited to listen. So yes, yeah, hi, Julia. Yes. Yeah, a follow up to what Julia was mentioning. Uh, Uruguay was a member of, of that group of countries that she mentioned. So um, definitely, uh, I think national adaptation plans are an excellent tool uh, in these times of crisis. Meaning when you're processing a national adaptation plan, you are looking at the present and also at the future. And, and it builds uh, uh, resilience in, to, to many different crises, not only climate change. And two key points I'm going to say. Um, one is when we're looking at forests in our national adaptation plan, we had um, two, two aspects, the plantations and mainly eucalyptus and pines and the natural forests. And when we started doing this vulnerability assessment, well, one thing is that at least for plantations, people are always looking long-term and that's, that's a strength they have. But then also, um, the, the, sorry, the, um, in national forests, you also need to look long-term. And um, talking about the vulnerability assessment, one of the things we did was finding um, what are the synergies that there are between trees and other production systems. Uruguay has a big area of the country that is um, dedicated to livestock production and we found what are the synergies between uh, those trees and livestock production, mainly uh, providing shade and shelter for, for cattle, shade for the summer, uh, shelter for the winters and the storms. And, and that help us look at the landscape level of what, how trees uh, interact with other production systems. And how did we do this vulnerability assessment? We um, call stakeholders um, in each of the production system to, to do this vulnerability assessment. And, and the second key point that I wanted to uh, highlight is the importance or in the involvement of the stakeholders in this vulnerability assessment. One thing we learn is that talking with the stakeholders, we're able to find things that we're not able to find in a desk study. Uh, Uruguay had done some vulnerability assessment a few years before doing this national adaptation plan process. And, and we were uh, pleasantly surprised to, to find key points, very important points that were very uh, crucial to the success of the production system that were not found on the test studies. So these are the two points, talking about uh, involvement of stakeholders and looking at the synergies and the interactions that exist between different production systems. In this case, plantations, natural forest, and livestock production. Thank you for the opportunity to share my experience. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, Cecilia. Very good, interesting. There's one question that came up for you uh, just now, really just asking, where and how are NAPs making a difference? So, um, so far the difference is uh, um, that the, the NAP process has been being able to have a complete picture of, of the present uh, challenges and, and how they relate to the future challenges associated with climate change. Um, we launched the National Adaptation Plan in September of 20, 2019. And we are in the first process, uh, steps of implementation. And the one thing we're working at this point is in something that was mentioned before, and that's metrics. Trying to um, get a baseline for the monitoring and uh, reporting of our national adaptation plan so that we can um, have coherent strategies for the implementation. This is the point where we are now. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Um, not there are quite uh, one or two questions, but I think in the interest of time, we'll I think we'll move on to just get a view from the the listening uh, listeners and the participants on what they are getting from all of what you've talked about. It's been very rich. So I'll invite the Slido session to to come up um, so that we begin a concluding phase in terms of what people have gathered. 
Um, the next slide or question slide is off. What are the most promising actions to increase the contribution of forests, trees, and agroforestry to resilience of food systems? Based on all of what you've heard, can you get onto your Slido links and, and, and start typing in, please? We need to start seeing things. Yeah, things are coming up. Okay, stakeholder participation. Genetic studies. We've got silver pastures. Integrating needs of communities with three choice. Agricultural policies conducive to the development of agroecology, collaboration, policy framework, increasing biodiversity, making stakeholder partnership, syntropic agriculture, interesting one. Create a level playing field for sustainable agriculture, resilience coming up. Adaptation, diversification of products, involving the private sector landowners and communities. What funding, conserve food trees, food trees quickly, better integrate risk management and resilience as an objective of policies and measures. Once again, climate smart agriculture, breaking silos that refers to the previous point about collaboration, sustainable intensification, seeds and seedling systems, bamboo has a great potential, landscape finance, empowering local communities. I think communities are coming up quite a lot. Uh, nurseries, finance, funding came up before, information sharing, in, again, involving local communities. Oh, interesting one, indigenous knowledge coming up. Uh, collaboration and policy coherence, uh, very interesting. Invest, invest in, in improvement of food uh, trees to diversify foods. Um, okay, cross-cutting stakeholder and multi-level linkage, nurseries, landscape approach, quite a multitude of things, I think. We've got, we've got quite some interesting things and echoing a lot of the things that people have been, have been talking about. And I, and I think it's important to keep, keep putting this up uh, um, as we go, but uh, we'll, we'll stop at some point because a lot of the things are coming back again, but very interesting things in terms of communities, landscape approaches, financing, breaking silos, you know, uh, uh, collaboration and things like that. So I'll, we'll, we'll stop there, but keep putting that, keep putting your feedback. Uh, there is a site uh, that we've created a chat box that with the link that we'll show you later on where you can put up some things that we will follow up on. So let's get now to our closing panel that will reflect on all of what has been said by all our great people. Uh, really, really good talks. I, I like all of them, actually. Uh, and we have four people. We have Vincent Gitz, Ramni Yamnadas of ECRAFT, Julia, Julia Wolf that already spoke, and, and Cecile Bibian Jebet, uh, who is uh, 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 the chairperson and president of Rikaf, Rika, Rifakov in, in based in Cameroon. Uh, Ramni is, is a principal scientist at ECRAF. Uh, Julia, we already introduced, this, is based at FAO, and Vincent Gitt spoke to you earlier. So each of them will have two minutes to reflect on, on what has been said and to draw some broad conclusions on what they've captured. We'll start with uh, Cecile, who will talk to about us about what she's picked up on and what reflection she has on the impact of COVID-19 on various sectors. Cecile, can thank you take you. It on? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Peter. I hope you, you hear me. Yeah, I think we very have well. a very great, very great discussions, a lot of issues, a lot of uh, ideas, and it came very clearly that trees are very important. Trees are very important, forests are very important for food, for health, for communities' uh, livelihood. So this is a fact, but to be able to 
to maintain that richness to improve the contribution of trees, we need enabling conditions. The policy should be adopted. The national adaptation plan should be inclusive because I have also some experiences while designing them in some countries, they were extremely excluding people. So they need to be inclusive. And we need, as they were saying, uh, we need some alternative for tree planting. And above everything, because as we are seeing now that COVID-19 can worsen the situation, talking about uh, uh, on communities uh, and more especially on for the rural women, COVID can really uh, 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 influence and worsen their situation. So we need to make sure that we have security for tenure. That did not come clearly on the, by, from the speakers, but we cannot plant trees when the, the, the tenure system is not secure. And we cannot plant tree only to plant trees. So we need also to develop what I can consider like synergy between the two decades that are coming, uh, the decade for family farming and the decade for ecosystem uh, restoration. I think we put them together and make sure the best of, of aircraft and the research and the scientists is to provide the resources, the seed, the, the, the genetics material for communities and all other partner, uh, part, uh, uh, stakeholders to better manage our landscape and to make sure we, are, we sustain food system in our villages and in our cities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cecile. It couldn't be better said. Really, really interesting points. Tenure coming up, synergies, alternatives, really great points. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to Ramni. Uh, Ramni, yeah. uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how technical solutions, important technical solutions, your reflections on how we can help us uh, overcome the crisis and better prepare for anything that is coming in the future? Well, we haven't, thank you, Peter. We haven't overcome the crisis, but uh, besides washing our hands, I think uh, to be better prepared is what we should be talking about. And uh, in the long-term approach, I think the first and foremost thing we would should do is actually capture the knowledge in forestries and agroforestry on the coping strategies that have taken place and, and actually synthesize all that uh, and how to move ahead in uh, expanding on that and improving on the current coping strategies from these communities. But having said that, I think we, within forestries, agroforestry landscapes, we really do need to start looking at the zoonotics and the epidemiology of diseases and the, and, um, and crises like this uh, for future as well, so that we really understand and have our vulnerability assessments and those interventions that we propose for future in place for future such challenges. But more specifically, I would say, looking at some of the presentations, eco-based adaptation or the use of agroecological approaches, uh, we really do, do need to invest in these to find cost and time effective solutions. We know that these concepts are local context specific, so cannot generalize them. One, one solution does not fit all. So we really do need our donors to invest there more and we need to convince them about that. We know that genetic quality as, uh, as expressed in adaptation or input supply systems are important, whether in agroforestry or forestry systems for livelihood benefits. And yet they're ignored. We need to understand why are they ignored? Why, why, why don't people get it? But that the seed is what, what you put garbage in, garbage out. How do we convince them? Then in the context of uh, forestries and agroforestry, how best to marry trees with crops? We don't have enough of that knowledge. Uh, and yes, agroecology will bring that up. A diversification of food systems is the other thing. Um, how best to address diversification of food systems, considering that uh, what Alice said, many of our foods are in the forests are still wild. Just in Africa, there are 80, uh, uh, 80 food trees that we know of, which are wild. How do we bring them, mainstream them? There's a lot of research that still needs to be done to address that. But excellent presentations from everyone. And hopefully we will have uh, responses to 
real responses to COVID next time. And hope next time it doesn't happen for COVID. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks, Ramni. Very, very, very useful points. Thank you. Julia, how are we? Can we get some reflections from your side on what, uh, what is the role of public policies and international organizations from what you've heard, please? Sure. So, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed the session. I have to say lots of great examples. So that, that's always very rich. And I can confirm also from the FEO side um, and, and looking at impossible impacts of COVID-19 on food systems, um, we, we are really along on similar lines. Um, so I hear three main points uh, that crisis, they um, have impacts wherever in the food systems and they're often in a very unexpected way. And uh, I guess we all learned that during like, the lockdown. And uh, one of the points I'm graduating is that um, in, in case we, we are able to do vulnerability assessments um, ex ante and, and include this in, in the planning process, we will be able to predict impacts and therewith reduce impacts. But what is key that was also said is the, the inclusiveness of the, of the process to, so to work with stakeholders. And then another point that is really important is the coordination of actors and policies for like a response mechanism. And that's also something that became very clear in, in COVID. There is a time factor in it, no? right? So, so that's really important. So let me let, um, say uh, two, three more things. So I think um, what I'd like to uh, conclude with is that um, the food system discussion can be definitely enriched. And like, I, I think the global um, the, um, the conference here will actually strengthen the, the argument and the consideration for looking more at trees and uh, agroforestry systems on, on how they can be really part of the solution when it comes to climate change and also when it comes to um, looking at more resilient systems that, that um, provide um, livelihoods and communities that were mentioned just in the in the assessment and with more opportunities and more um, sustained livelihoods in, in the long run. And this need to be complemented by institutions and by policy frameworks. I, I really like the point of the over-regulation really to understand where are the trees, are they in the forest, are they outside the forest and how to actually look at, at a conducive environment to, to have a, a, a like nature-based response that, that helps um, building resilient societies over time. Thank you. we go to Vincent Gitz, who would tell us a little bit about what science can bring to the table, and especially because he's directing FTA, what, what can FTA bring to the table? Yes, thanks, thanks Peter, and thanks everybody for the, the, the incredible insights. I think what, what is very interesting uh, in, in the current discussion, despite the fact that we are living a terrible crisis, is that in the re rebuilding better, there are uh, things that, uh, in fact, we, we, are, we were studying for quite a long time that are reappearing at the center. And, and we've seen uh, that resilience is not coming up uh, very strongly as the desired quality of our food system, of agriculture. Um, a few years ago, it was still the productivity debate, for, for instance. Uh, and uh, we've seen today, I think, uh, examples by which, uh, like from uh, Eduardo, by which uh, trees can reduce risks uh, uh, of, of farmers, the potential of agroecology that Fergus mentioned, and also uh, processes that can that exist at international level, uh, such as uh, uh, the, the discussion on the future of food systems. We, we have very high hopes uh, in the in the UN food systems summit and, and also at national level, the preparation of the NAPs. So these are all together with local actions, uh, huge opportunities by which the, the current momentum, I would say, or, or, or sensitivity to our building resilience can be put in the agenda. And therefore the role of forestry and agroforestry, which we can explain and, and, and give solution on how that can contribute to, to resilience. And I, there was also, a very good uh, uh, idea that was mentioned. It, it, when we look at reconciling, uh, for example, uh, environmental fighting environmental degradation uh, and, and, and fighting poverty, 
it's really looking, looking at the two in an integrated way. So uh, the decade of family farming and the decade on restoration, it, it is people centered. So just let me tell you what I take uh, from what we should do. And Vincent, you need to wrap up quickly. Uh, yes, 30 seconds. Yeah. 30 seconds. What we are going to do in terms of research, we're going to look at the impacts of the current crisis, the COVID crisis, on the sectors where we work. Uh, what does it make? Or different countries, different landscape, different value chains. So then there's already a lot of things we know about the, these kinds of impact, you know, on livelihoods, on poverty, on, on, on migration. We're going to mobilize this and see how that can be applied, you know, immediately in the response to the present crisis. But also more importantly, I think, in looking at the research in the future, what this crisis has and shown it has really yeah. stretched our food systems to the max. Just let me 10 seconds. And, um, and, and we are going to use what happens now to increase our knowledge on how these systems are working, uh, understanding the risk and the vulnerability, revisiting those, and, 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 and building an agenda around resilience uh, for in landscapes, in value chains, and um, for people that depend on, on, on those. So if you want to send uh, uh, your... Thanks. There is a chat box, a link will be um, appear in the chat box, I think, uh, and we will try to involve everybody uh, in, in that process of gathering evidence and looking at the research agenda. Thanks, Peter, and sorry thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks, uh, Vincent. So uh, uh, all our participants, thank you very much, hundreds of them online from all over the world. We thank you really very much for getting involved in this. A big thank you to our speakers. We are out of time, unfortunately, um, but it was very exciting. Lots of interesting examples from Ethiopia, Latin America, Uruguay, Uganda, uh, 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 India, and, and, and everywhere, all around the world. So we hope that you can keep bring on some contributions on the online form, and we'll be in touch, and we hope this can be a discussion that, that continues. A big thank you to everyone. And, and, and thank you for being here. Thanks, everyone, thank and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. bye. Keep safe and keep well. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. And to all the presenters and panelists. Thank everybody. you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. It was great. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you for organizing this. Thank you. Hi, Julian. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> Cecilia, we have the same name. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs> bye. Bye. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye, bye. bye Peter. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks.